people are still logging on, but um, thank you so much um, for joining our symposium today. Um, so we welcome you all also with um, Tobias Grafke and uh, Eric Vanden Einten, um, the other two organizers of this mini symposium. Um, again, it's great that, that you are here. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got four talks today and I hope you'll, you'll have a chance to catch um, all of them. The idea is really to sort of bring sort of different areas of interest in the realm of rare events uh, together and sort of discuss recently developed methods and uh, progress in the field. There was quite a lot of work and there were quite a few of breakthroughs and I don't know, no spoilers right now. So I'll, I'll leave this to all the people who are presenting. Um, each talk should be around um, 45 minutes with like 15 minutes of questions afterwards. And uh, we'll have a lunch break from um, 12 to one. And also at the end of the, the day, uh, we'll, we'll have some time for an open discussion, um, informal. And well, that's it from my side. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And I think I'll leave the floor to Tobias. Yeah, well, thank you for the introduction. I'll try to share my desktop first. That's maybe roughly visible. Maybe you have a black bar at the top, I don't know. Black bar, but it's oh, perfect. That's just the controlled, I guess, from Zoom. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so as the, the first talk of this symposium, I will be talking a bit more about, I mean, the, the symposium title, Recent Progress in Understanding of Rare Events and Complex Systems and the Connection to Machine Learning. Um, there's a lot of phrases in there. So I will be concentrating mostly on rare events and the complex system parts. And in particular, I will consider rare events in fluid turbulence. Um, fluid turbulence maybe being the prime example of a complex system, and arguably the most complex system of classical physics. And I will concentrate on situations where we, can observe coherent structures and have turbulence maybe more merely as some kind of background noise that induces transitions then. And this allows us to use well-known rare events techniques um, from rather simple to more complicated to these uh, very complex systems and reason about the, the long time statistics of these systems. Um, so what you, what you see here is, for example, a coherent structure that's the, the big red spot on Jupiter. It's a bit of an artist impression, I think, so it has been uh, Photoshop to make it a bit more attractive as one example of a very long lived object that lives parallel to a rather turbulent flow, namely the atmosphere of Jupiter. Um, so similar systems of this kind, the examples that I consider are atmospheric flows, pipe flows, and to a lesser degree also uh, the climate of Earth. So for each of these, these are extremely complicated systems which a lot with a very large number of degrees of freedom. But they have one commonality, and that's the one that I will focus on. They all um, admit some kind of scale separation. So in these systems, there's a scale separation between what I will call the coherent structures, uh, very loosely defined, and the fluctuations, which are merely the rest. For atmospheric flows under certain conditions, these coherent structures will be atmospheric jets. Here you can see one of them. So this is um, a picture of the vorticity. Um, or the potential vorticity on a rotating planet, and you have the fluid flowing predominantly to the right direction, the light blue region, and in this center region it flows predominantly to the left. So this is an, uh, uh, an atmospheric jet, and these atmospheric jets are extremely long-lived despite the fact that this is a, a turbulent system in the background, and they are fed by energy uh, with energy from the turbulent background field. Uh, another system that I will show is pipe flows and transition to turbulence in pipe flows, where there is less clear what the scale separation precisely is, but there are models that then again talk about coherent structures, namely localized patches of turbulence that are stable for a long time, interspersed by laminar regions that are also stable for a long time. So the coherent structures that I talk about there will be turbulent puffs or turbulent patches. And lastly, there's also Earth's climate, where you have macroscopic climate states that are also stable for long times, but eventually might flip to other climate states as well. So these are all brought together by some intuitive notions. I will not be very precise here and probably not throughout the, the whole talk. I guess I leave that to the other talks a bit and uh, be operating more a bit on this intuitive level where I say this, 
this scale separation allows me to separate noise from dynamics. I have dynamics and I have fluctuations and I can shut off the dynamics and just talk, uh, shut off the noise and just talk about the dynamics in isolation and then think about something like an energy landscape picture where I have valleys that correspond to locally stable, statistically stable fixed points and mountain ridges that separate them. So this is a very transition, uh, traditional picture of metastability and immediately invokes a whole um, arsenal of tools from transition state theory and transition path theory and maybe important sampling Monte Carlo, large deviations and so on. Um, all of these will be applicable to that, but the systems are so complicated that we will hardly get to that. Um, so to make this a bit more concrete, if it would be a very simple system, an SDE, these are the most simple systems to treat. These are reversible systems, if the following is true. So an SDE is a reversible system if the drift term is given by the gradient of a potential. So I define the potential U that maps from my state space, in this case, maybe two-dimensional, to the reals, and the drift of this equation is given by minus the gradient of this potential. So everything is flowing downhill, if you want. Then this, this energy landscape picture exactly applies, of course. The stable fixed points are localized valleys. There is this mountain ridge in between with a saddle point. Transitions between them will happen through this saddle point. So the, the, the vector field is the gradient flow field here pointing downhill. And you can clearly see these attracting fixed points and the uh, unstable fixed point at the center. You can also talk about the stationary density in this, uh, in this SDE, which is also given by the potential and this smallest parameter in front of the noise and it's proportional to this in the exponent. The situation becomes much more complicated if this system becomes irreversible because then I can no longer easily define a potential. So if I have an arbitrary drift field B here, I can no longer color it. I also stopped coloring the other one. So here B is arbitrary, not necessarily a potential, which you can clearly see is the case here because I have flow that is circular or goes, goes around this. Um, so the vector field is basically allowed to do anything it wants to. And we can no longer talk about which point is higher up in some landscape or further down. There is still a notion of what the stationary density will do in the low noise limit. In particular, that's um, what large deviation theory will be about in these metastable situations. The stationary density can be approximated in the small noise limit, again, by an exponential. And in the exponent, I have the so-called quasi-potential, which I will talk a bit more about later on. So it admits a very similar form. But the most basic similarities between the, these two systems, what I can still talk about is I still have fixed points on these systems. So what used to be the bottoms of the two valleys, I still have two points here that deterministically attract the flow. So if I start anywhere here, I will eventually decay either to A or to B. And there is also this intermediate point, unstable fixed point S, that used to be a saddle point. Now it does not really make sense anymore to call it a saddle point because there is no potential, but I still name it S. So this situation between the two is very similar. I can still think about um, fixed points and transition states, intermediate states, um, somewhere in between. And even further, I can still define basins of attraction of the individual fixed points. I mean, of course, in an arbitrary system, these, these fixed points need not be points. They can, of course, be uh, limit cycles or even chaotic sets, um, much more complicated. But for now, let's think about them as points. So I can um, distribute my whole set of states into subsets that will be attracted to the individual attractors. For example, all points colored in red, if I would ignore the noise, would eventually decay to A, while all the points in green decay to B. This is, of course, again, in the potential picture, there's this mountain ridge, which defines this separatrix, and everything on the right flows downhill to B, and everything on the left flows downhill to A. But in the, in the irreversible system with arbitrary flow field, this still holds true that I can define these sets. So the red set will be attracted to A, and the green set will be attracted to B. The blue line, the so-called separatrix, I can also observe here. And this saddle point or transition point will always lie on the separatrix. In fact, it's a very important point on the separatrix. Namely, if I would um, restrict my dynamics only to the separatrix, which in this case is one dimensional. So I ignore everything perpendicular to the separatrix and only consider dynamics within the separatrix, then these saddle points would be attractive structures in this sub-manifold. Sub 
which is of course a way to find them eventually. And um, finally then, of course, if I considered finite noise, I can have transitions between those fixed points and the low temperature limit, we expect them to transition through this edge state. So S is the state on the separatrix to, to which we expect the transition to happen. Um, so to summarize a bit of what I talked about here is for reversible systems, we have this potential U. It intuitively quantifies something like the difficulty to, re to reach any point X. The higher U of X, the di more difficult it is to reach point X because you need to fight the deterministic dynamics. And the system wants to flow downhill in U. So U is a Lyapunov function, if you will. For the irreversible systems, I'm a bit more vague. I say there is such a thing as the so-called quasi-potential, which is now a function of two states, X and Y. And it quantifies the difficulty to go from X to Y. And importantly, if it's irreversible, we can no longer deduce the transition probability of going from X to Y from the reverse one, from Y to X, while here you can. So this function needs to be of two states. But within the basin of attraction of a point A, still the system wants to flow downhill in this potential. The, the flow is not exactly, exactly gradient V, but still V decreases along the deterministic trajectory. So it's still a Lyapunov function. So now V evaluated at A and Y the difficulty of going from the attractive fixed point to any other point in the same basin of attraction. So this can all be de um, defined rather rigorously through a large deviation theory, and I will not go into this, um, but I expect maybe some of the other talks might. So in total, then, you could, you could employ the whole um, mechanism of sample path large deviation theory to compute instanton-like trajectories that connect fixed points through saddle points, compute the probability of transitions, and compute the quasi-potential in principle. So the systems that I mentioned are very complicated and it's very hard to compute these instantons. You know, usually I'm in the business of doing exactly that. Um, this time I, I will not talk about instanton computations for these systems. So the goals are a bit um, smaller here. Okay, so let's apply this to the first example that I was talking about, namely atmospheric jets. Um, this situation is comparably clean, so let me, do some kind of derivation of what I exactly mean. I consider 2D stochastically forced barotropic beta plane turbulence. That's rather a mouthful, but it's not too complicated. It's just 2D Navier-Stokes equation, incompressible, with an additional term, that's the so-called beta term, which encodes the Coriolis forces because this is on a rotating planetary surface. So it's one layer of the atmosphere of a large rotating planet. I consider the whole domain to be periodic, which is of course incorrect for a planet, but you can maybe think that this is just a tiny region on the surface of a rotating planet where I then want to ignore boundary conditions, so I pick them to be periodic. This defines my velocity field and I have a stream function and a vorticity field that are just defined in the standard way. If I, if I look at these systems for the right parameters, what I observe are exactly these general sets that I alluded to earlier. So if you choose a high enough beta and the other parameters well defined as well, um, the situation that you will reach is um, that multiple jets will form and will remain in place for very long times. So the whole system is driven by some noise, but still on long time scales, jets will emerge and will stay there. These are zonal jets. They go in the X, Y direction because the symmetry is broken from the beta term. So how can we isolate them dynamically? The idea here is based on an idea by um, Freddy Boucher and co-workers, where we consider zonally average quantities. I define uppercase quantities to be the integral over X of the full 2D fields. And then I expand every field as the zonally average quantity plus some smallest parameter alpha that occurs here as well, that I will not go into here. Um, plus fluctuations. I just insert this into the full equation, and then I reach a coupled system of equations, one for the zonal jets, the zonal degrees of freedom, and one for the whole rest, where I drop these tildes, so this omega is this omega tilde, um, and where you can clearly see that this is an equation that now only operates on y, because everything is average in x direction, including this interaction with the fluctuating term, that's averaging, so the over bar is averaging over x, of the interaction between V and omega. That's the only nonlinear term. And I also chose to drop the nonlinear self-interaction of the fluctuations. So the fluctuating vorticity field is now a linear equation, which is why this 
coupled system of equations is often termed quasi-linear approximation, or this whole approach is the quasi-linear approach. It's not linear, but the fluctuation field is linear. Okay, so now this becomes interesting as soon as you consider that this alpha parameter basically constitutes a separation of time scales. Alpha occurs here, alpha no longer occurs here except for the friction term, which we tend to ignore or renormalize in the end anyway. So what I can effectively do, this is just a copy of the same equation that I was just talking about, is thinking about the limit alpha to zero, infinite time scale separation between the jets and the fluctuations, meaning the jets are very long lived in comparison to the fluctuations and the fl fluctuations are very quick in comparison to the jets. Because if we do that, this allows us to obtain, obtain something like a law of large number type effective evolution of U since this Reynolds stress is self-averaging. So if I go alpha to zero, I can define a new temporal quantity, alpha t, and express um, the zonal degrees of freedom as an evolution equation, this tau variable. Instead of the instantaneous Reynolds stress, I can consider this to be in a temporal average of the Reynolds stress because this is self-averaging, this is moving so quickly, and the rest uh, is just friction. While for the... Um, turbulent fluctuations, I instead consider a so-called virtual fast process. So this is so quick that I can consider the, the jet profile to be basically constant. What happens then is that I can integrate the fast equation, assuming a constant u, and I can inst integrate the slow equation, assuming the average outcome of the fast one instead of the instantaneous one. So I can then compute exactly what is this average because this is a linear equation. And what you end up with is this coupled system of equations. That's the same as before. That's the evolution of the zonal degrees of freedom. And I have a stationary Lyapunov equation that just determines what will be the covariance of the, velocity, of the vorticity fluctuations. It's a complicated Lyapunov equation because this gamma encodes a lot of information about the jets. But it's basically what is the stationary covariance structure of vorticity fluctuations, assuming a constant jet, background jet. So this is how the turbulence aligns itself around the jet if the turbulence wouldn't influence the jets. And then once I have obtained this approximation, I can use it as a step forward in this um, jet equation to evolve the, uh, the jet profile itself. So maybe this was all a bit lengthy, but what I will end up with in the end is an evolution equation, a closed evolution equation of the zonal degrees of freedom. So the only quantities that are unknown and that remain unknown are a field u of y that's only one dimensional. And the stationary states that I will end up with are these sinusoidal looking jet solutions. <clears throat> All right, you can then compare this to the fully nonlinear system and you exactly observe jets at the locations or at the rough amplitudes where you would observe them in the fully nonlinear system if alpha is small. So now we can go back to the picture that I was pointing earlier. Because we can use this, this splitting in, into jet background, uh, jet structures and turbulent background effectively as some kind of landscape picture. Because for some ranges of parameters, I obtain multiple fixed points of these effective zonal dynamics. For example, for some, for some parameters, I have coexistence of a stable four jet and a five jet solution. They have corresponding basins of attraction and an edge state. So this is what I want to obtain. So first off, here's what the four and five jet solutions look like. And in these effective zonal dynamics, both of these are locally deterministically stable. And I can also, for example, through edge tracking, look at this edge state. And this is how this one will look like. So this is the edge state between the four and the five jet solution. So U5 is the five jet solution and U hat is this edge state. It lies exactly on the separatrix, meaning you see that it's also roughly five jets but one of the jets is a bit smaller and it's exactly smaller to a degree that if I would make it ever so slightly smaller again, it will decay to four jets. While if I would make it a bit bigger then it would retain the fifth jet and drop back to, to the five jet state. <clears throat> the next thing that I can do, it's actually the last thing I will do for the jets is to look at the heteroclinic orbit that connects these fixed points. So this is the trajectory of the deterministic flow field. It's of course, in a large space because there's still a PDE, um, from the edge towards the five jet and the four jet solution, connecting the three fixed points. And this is how this looks like in some arbitrary arc length parameter S from zero to one, interpolating between the five jet 
and the four jet state and the edge state is of course also on that. So you can see somehow like how the, the fifth jet starts to disappear and then you have some overshooting going on until it um, goes to the four jet solution. So this is computed via the string method. Okay, um, let's head over to the next example that I want to highlight. This is transition to turbulence in pipe flows. So what exactly do I mean with pipe flows? Pipe flow is simply a fluid contained in the pipe. I will consider um, a simplified setup here saying that the fluid is basically Navier-Stokes equation, 3D incompressible, confined to a pipe where in streamwise direction, so along the pipe, I assume the boundary conditions to be periodic, which makes it maybe a bit unrealistic because actual pipes in experiment are probably not periodic, or if they are periodic, they're probably curved. Um, while in the spanwise direction, the domain is circular or maybe rectangular with no slip boundary. A lot is known about this model and the transition to turbulence in this model. It's arguably maybe the beginning of turbulence theory in the first place, thinking about this model. Um, but effectively what happens is that the Reynolds number is much smaller than the critical Reynolds number. The flow will be laminar. You can exactly calculate the laminar flow profile. If the Reynolds number is much higher, it's turbulent everywhere. And there is this transitional region where you have these patches of turbulence localized, but locally stable, interspersed with laminar regions in between. <clears throat> so now I want to somehow isolate a similar picture than before. And in transition to turbulence, this is traditionally done in a modeling approach that's very specific, namely modeling this onset of turbulence as an excitable media. So this goes back mostly to, to Barclay. And the idea here is instead of considering a full 3D domain and Navier-Stokes equation, I only consider a 1D domain, only the x direction along the pipe. And I define two quantities. One is the turbulent activity Q at some pipe location. And the other is the center line velocity U. So turbulent activity, however it's precisely de defined, intuitively means how much turbulence is at that location along the pipe, zero where it's laminar and large, whatever, where there's lots of turbulence. And then these quantities interact in the following way. Q is considered bistable. It can be in a laminar state or in a turbulent state. So the dyna dynamics are effectively um, a double well, not a gradient of a double well. While the center line velocity has the property that if strong turbulence is present, then the velocity will be depleted because velocity is somehow redirected into other directions. It's not just pointing downwards the pipe. So areas of high turbulence move slower than the laminar flow. And to that, you can also add stochasticity where you say Q is the only field that fluctuates proportional to its own strength. So this is multiplicative noise. The effective model that you reach, not too important to grasp the details, but it's very simple. It's basically two coupled um, advection reaction diffusion equations where the reaction terms F and G depend on both degrees of freedom. F is just bistable in Q if U is large enough to sustain turbulence. So for small U, it will be uh, just have a single stable fixed point. But if U is large enough, you have two stable states. And G is just linearly restoring to some background velocity, that will be the laminar velocity or the turbulent mean velocity, depending on the current version of, of Q that is here. So it will be slower here and faster here. This alone is enough to very precisely model the whole transition to turbulence um, that very exactly compares to experiments. So you can fiddle with the parameters there, but it very neatly um, explains a lot of um, phenomena that you can observe in experiment. In particular, you can do the same story, as I just said. Of course, if the Reynolds number is smaller than the critical one, it's laminally stable. We have these turbulent puffs, if you approach the critical Reynolds number from below, that are stable for a long time, but eventually decay. So you need to have started with a turbulent puff to begin with, because the noise is multiplicative and laminar is absorbing. So if you are laminar, you will never exit the state. But if you start with a puff, it will survive for a long time and then eventually decay. If you are slightly above the critical Reynolds numbers, puffs are more pronounced and ex actually are able to split into multiple puffs. And exactly at the critical Reynolds number, you have a balance between this decay and this split effect. So the critical Reynolds number would be somewhere here. What's um, drawn here is the mean lifetime of the puffs and they can die either by decaying or they can die by splitting into two. And at this crossover point, the times associated with decaying and split are exactly the same. So you have this balance 
and this interacting gas of puffs that spontaneously decay and also split so that their rough population number will remain constant. If you go even higher in Reynolds numbers, you have these so-called turbulent slugs instead of puffs that expand. So puffs are no longer stable. If you have turbulence somewhere, this turbulent region will grow over time and eventually fill the whole domain with turbulence. So the important regime is the center regime for me, and that's the one that I will co uh, concentrate on. So this is the regime where you have stable puffs, you have puff decay, and you also have puff splitting coexisting. And the question that I want to ask is, how do these processes exactly happen? And in particular, I can again employ this language that I was introducing at the beginning. What is the basin of attraction of the puff state versus the lamina and maybe the two puff states? What are the edges towards these other basins of attraction? So what's the edge of the on the separatrix between lamina and puff or between puff and two puff? And these I can exactly look at in this model. And that's what I want to do. So the schematic is very similar to before. Now that only that I have um, three basins of attraction, the center one, the blue one for the puff. Then I can go to the lamina regime where there's nothing left, or I can obtain two puffs out of one puff. And the corresponding separatrices in black have two distinct points on them. It's probably more complicated than simple points, but we will get to that. One of them I will decay, label the decay edge state. That's the one towards decaying to the lamina one. And one is the split edge towards the two puff state. So the first thing that I would to look at is how do these fixed points look deterministically? It's uh, possible to compute these by some edge tracking algorithms. So that's puff to lamina. I try to fit the um, color map to, to the scheme. So blue is the puff, red is the lamina state, and I'm plotting Q of X. So that's the turbulent activity along the pipe. Lamina, of course, means no turbulence at all. The puff state means I have localized activity at the location of the puff. And the decay edge state is the um, turbulence localized to a point, but to a degree only exactly so far that if I would be slightly above, I would end up being a puff. But if it would be slightly below, I would end up being lamina. So in some sense, this is comparable to a critical nucleus in Alan Kahn or kahn hillier dynamics, where I need to excite at least this much in order to bridge the barrier. <clears throat> I can similarly compute this heteroclinic orbit connecting lamina to puff through the decay, which you can see here. It's not very exciting looking at just drops in amplitude, but you can um, identify where exactly is this decay edge simply because this is a fixed point of the dynamics again. It's an unstable fixed point, but it's a fixed point. So you can just look at what's the amplitude of the drift term for all these configurations, and here it will be zero, while everything else would be finite, except at the final and the initial point would be zero again, because these are also fixed points. So that's the things that we can again do deterministically here. Now in this system, I also want to highlight what you can observe if, if you look at stochastic transitions. So I switch on the noise. So far, I only looked at the deterministic system, what are the fixed points looking at in their tunic orbit. But if I switch on the noise, I can sample individual transitions. Um, and this is one of uh, one such thing. So this is a, a, a single sample of a puff decay starting from a stochastic puff solution towards the lamina flow. You need to wait a long time for, to observe this. Um, so I selectively picked one situation where it happens. Uh, and the question is, how can exactly I now locate where, it, where I cross the separatrix? And the important quantity in this connection is the so-called committer function. So I have this single sample of a decay, of a stochastic decay. And at each configuration that I, that I obtain here, I can do the following experiment. I can ask, starting a new stochastic simulation at that point, or at that point, or at that point, how likely will it be that I end up in the puff or that I end up in the lamina state? Of course, if I start with a puff, it's very likely that I will remain a puff because they are very stable. If I'm lamina, I will remain lamina. But in between somewhere here, there must be a switch over point. And that's quantified by this committer function. That's the likelihood of transitioning to a puff decay. The likelihood is zero, close to zero here, switches to one here, and somewhere crosses the one half in the middle. This is the way to stochastically locate exactly the location of the separatrix um, by I mean, in this case, I eyeball roughly where this line crosses the 0.5 state. So 
at this location, it's exactly as likely to um, move forward to stochastically to a laminar flow than it would be to go back to the decay state. Once you have obtained a lot of samples of this type, you can align all the samples along this line because there's often a, an alignment problem. If you sample many transition events, how would you compare them? How can you get the average transition event? You always have the problem of where exactly do I compare them? I, I cannot easily average them over time because I do not know how they relate to each other in time. So the point that I choose to align them at and the point that is sensible if you want to compare them around the separatrix is the 50% committer point. It's the halfway point, it's the point around the separatrix. So if I then take many samples and average them, I recover the average stochastic decay event from path to lamina state through the 50% committer. So I can do a similar story towards the path splitting and there are it's a bit more interesting because more stuff happens, of course. So again, I want to consider a path, but now I have a slightly higher Reynolds number so that splits are a bit more likely. You could do it with a lower Reynolds number as well, but then you need to wait a very long time. And the effects are very similar though. So again, blue is a single path. It's slightly wider because the Reynolds number is a bit higher. And green is a two path state. So I have a, I, an isolated path here and I have another isolated path a bit further down the line. It's slightly lower in amplitude um, because it's still a bit shadowed by this one, but eventually it will separate even more if it was longer. And this is the deterministic split edge state. So that's exactly the point, the attractive point on the separatrix between the two basins of attraction. Again, you can locate that by integrating the reduced dynamics, the full dynamics reduced to the separatrix until they reach a stationary state, you obtain the split edge. Alternatively, of course, we can again look at the heterogeneic orbit that I sketched here from split to puff and from split to two puffs. So there's a bit more going on here. Um, and you can talk about in detail about what exactly happens. Maybe that's not too interesting to this audience. But what you notice here, the split edge is this interesting overlap. So we, we saw it here. It's basically a puff, but then it's elongated and has this gap in between. And the gap again is somehow the critical antinucleus that's just deep enough that if it would be slightly deeper, it would drive a wedge and separate the puffs. If it would be slightly less deep, it will eventually decay and con contract. And that's exactly what we see here. In this direction, the wedge deepens towards the two puff state and they eventually separate very slowly. Well, in this direction, the gap eventually disappears, leaving us exactly with one of these slug states that I was talking earlier, but at a Reynolds number where the slugs are not expanding but contracting towards the puff. So the transition event that we envision is starting from a puff, you, the, the easiest channel towards the edge, towards the separatrix, is driving a slug against the deterministic restoring dynamics and then driving a wedge into the slug that's just deep enough to have a split event. You can, of course, look whether this is true by again sampling these um, split events. So here I again show a single transition sample and the corresponding committer function. You see that I start with a single puff that's rather noisy. It will widen up over time. And just at the point where it's widened up and a gap starts to appear, I have crossed the 50% threshold. And then once I have two individual ones, I'm very likely to retain two puffs indefinitely. So at this point, it's, it's rather zoomed in around this region. At this point, this puff is still much bigger than that one, but eventually they, would, they are repelling, so they will uh, somehow fill the domain. <clears throat> Um, so I can again use this 50% committer to do some kind of um, averaging of this. It's a bit um, unclear whether this confirms or does not confirm the mechanism that I was talking about earlier because it's still rather noisy. And it's a bit hard to average them because the motion of the individual puffs is stochastic itself, so everything is rather smoothed out. But you can clearly see that stuff widens and then a gap appears. It's not clear what else could happen, but that's clearly what um, the stochastic simulations say. Okay, so this is um, the second example that I wanted to, to, to talk about where we have this meta stability in turbulent flows where I can look at the local stability of coherent structures. And the last one is um, Earth climate. So the idea here is, let's um, recently work together with George Ross and also Alessandro Laio and um, Valerio Lucarini, is to simulate Earth climate for very long times. So this is 
a simulation done by Georgios for very long times of an intermediate complexity climate model. It has roughly 10 to the five degrees of freedom. So it models stuff like um, wind, temperature distributed in several layers uh, around the whole planet in a reasonable accuracy in terms of resolution. Also um, ice coverage, topography, and so on. And if you integrate it for very long times, so you observe that, well, there is some kind of um, state around which you cluster usually. That's the current climate, if you will. Um, maybe one point to add is how do we add stochasticity? We want stochasticity in order to be able to, to make similar arguments as before, how to drive transitions and basins of attraction and so on. So stochasticity here is added through a fluctuating solar constant. We have a solar constant and that's changed in time and therefore manipulates the energy balance of the planet. This is maybe arguably a bit unphysical because the solar constant is rather con the solar constant is rather constant. Um, maybe except for if you have some kind of volcanic event, then maybe temporarily it will be much lower because there's a cloud cover. But usually it's rather constant, and it's it's definitely not white in time Gaussian that we assume here. So I agree that's that's maybe a weak point here, but you want to add some kind of stochasticity in the first place. It's also important to note that this is a single degree of freedom that's fluctuating. So I have a single degree of freedom forcing 10 to the five other degrees of freedom in their stochasticity. And I'm just looking at how the whole non-linearities that are present in the system propagate this um, fluctuating quantity throughout the whole system. But the, the important point here to note is that if you just wait long enough for these situations, what you will observe is sometimes, very rarely, this system transitions to another fixed point. And the other fixed point is the so-called snowball Earth state, the second metastable climate state. So this has been known before. I think it has been even confirmed that Earth has visited this state in the past, all of Earth covered in ice. Um, the mechanism is also rather intuitive, and the ice albedo feedback, probably you've heard about that, um, where you notice that snow and ice are white, so they reflect sunlight quite efficiently. So if all of Earth is covered in ice, a lot of sunlight is reflected and it, and it stays cold. While if most of Earth is not covered in ice, lots of sunlight is absorbed and it stays warm. So they are locally stable by this very simple feedback mechanism, but this is still replicated in this rather complicated climate model. You observe a, long of, a lot of times, if you wait for very long times, you would still be in this basin, but if you're very unlucky with your draw of the solar constant, or longer time, you eventually transition to the snowball earth and out again if you wait even longer. Um, the fluctuations are rather strong so that we are able to observe these anyway. So the lifetimes are maybe unphysical, but you observe these two stable states. Of course, a question to ask here is again, the same as I did before. How do these bases of attraction look? How does the edge state look? How do transitions happen? It's an even more complicated system. So I will be able to answer even less questions here, but at least, the same picture applies to a degree. So what I want to show you now is I want to project this very high number of degrees of freedom down to only two. One is the mean surface temperature, Ts. So that's the average of the temperature at all points that we resolve at the surface. And the other is the mean equator pole temperature difference. So this is the temperature averaged over an equatorial band compared to the uh, temperature averaged over a polar band. And if this is a high value, this means there's a huge difference between the temperature at the equator and at the pole. And if it's a small value, then there is a smaller difference. It will not be negative, I guess. <clears throat> a, um, equator is always warmer than the pole. So if you take a long simulation and take a lot of samples in this system, and eventually you map each of these individual data points in, in this 2D histogram, you end up with the following plot. So that's the surface temperature. And that's the uh, equator pole surface temperature difference. And you can clearly see these two local valleys in this histogram, one corresponding to um, the warm state, the current climate, and one corresponding to the snowball state. You see the mean surface temperature is like minus 60, it's rather cold. The um, temperature difference between equator pole is comparable, and the warm state has maybe 10 degrees or 15 mean surface temperature. So if you, this, this whole plot is just generated as a histogram of, of a long run or of multiple long runs, um, just taking each individual point as a sample with a large enough time difference that they are uncorrelated. 
Um, but you, it's somehow by eye easy to make out that there must be two states, right? You see, here's one and there's one, and maybe there's just, it's not, it's not so easy to, to maybe locate where's the separating line. So the next thing that you can do is look at the transitions. This is just done by waiting long enough to observe a transition, to observe multiple transitions, and then averaging them again. The averaging procedure is maybe not so straightforward, but maybe you can look at the um, publication to, to see exactly how. What I want to highlight here is that all of them look rather similar, but forward and backward transition, so warm to snowball and snowball to warm, individually look rather different. The process that drives you melting the snowball earth, this is the red one, is very different from the one that leads to a freezing of the warm climate. That's maybe expected because the system is very far out of equilibrium, so you don't expect clearly a picture where you have forward and backward transition to be the same, but we can quantify it. <clears throat> so um, this is uh, this is the story of the transitions. Um, you can you can of course identify some kind of physical mechanism of what exactly happens here. You have this very clear nose pointing downwards, and then it shoots upwards very quickly. Maybe one recommendation that I have is that George has produced very beautiful movies of the transition. So each of these points, of course, corresponds to a full climate state of Earth. It's not it's just a projection to a two D system. But each of these points, you have the whole wind field at all amplitudes and the whole temperature fields. So you can really see if you go along this transition in this YouTube video, how the wind behaves, how the ice cover grows or shrinks, and also what's the value of the solar constant that drives you from one point to the other. And it's rather nice and intuitive to look at these transitions um, in these videos. Uh, of course, the snowball says rather boring. Everything is frozen, no, um, no wind, no heat transfer in, in the ocean and so on. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe you have a look there. Um, so the, the last point that I want to address is, I kind of sloppily said, yeah, you could clearly see that there are two states. That was, of course, misleading. How can we be sure that, that we found all locally stable states? Can we be sure that we found all locally stable states? Maybe it would be rather more intuitive to say this system is obviously chaotic. Um, it must have a whole multifractal um, distribution of minima that are ever so more smaller in, in extent and also in depth, um, each of them harder to observe at a certain level of noise, but it's very surprising that there would be only two. And indeed, as it turns out, um, as we let the simulations for, run for quite a long time, we somewhat coincidentally found a third locally stable climate state. So the two that you see here are again the, the warm climate and the snowball climate, Snowball is the one where everything is ice covered and warm is the one where you have some ice coverage at the poles, but not in the center. And the third state is located somewhere here where most of the earth is covered in ice, but you have an equatorial band that's locally ice free. And this state is locally stable in the sense that if you switch off the fluctuating solar constant, I mean, the, the delta of the fluctuation solar constant. So there is still a, a solar constant, but it's set to its mean value. Then you will remain in this climate for very long times. It is locally stable. As soon as you have noise in the solar constant, you will be eventually driven out of it. And the basin is shallow in comparison to the others, meaning that a much smaller value of the noise already drives you out of this basin. Um, of course, this is, an, I mean, other people have found additional metastable climate states for various deep, uh, complicated climate models. Um, it's, I think, the first time it has been reported with this model, but it's arguably still a very artificial model in particular regards to the modeling of the ocean. It's called the swamp ocean model because there's no ocean circulation. Um, and it's, uh, as soon as you be, are more sophisticated, it might well be that this state disappears. But um, it's still exciting to see that you can locate this third state. And of course, this also makes you wonder whether there are even more states that you have been missing all along if you had even smaller value of the noise. And, and the question is a bit on how can we address this question a bit more systematically. And that's the question that we uh, aim at also in this paper. <clears throat> so the idea here is to find stationary states via data science techniques of um, clustering. So I can view my collection of data points that I have obtained from very long simulations, just as individual samples that sample from the probability distribution that reflects the invariant measure of this very high dimensional process. And stationary states 
would then be um, points at which these probability distributions are locally maximal. So they are local clusters of samples in this high dimensional state space. And there are efficient techniques of finding clusters in high dimensional data without putting in any knowledge of the underlying dynamics at all. So the, the algorithm that we end up using is the one by Lyo and co-authors, um, so-called unsupervised density peak clustering. And it's comparably simple, simple enough that I think I can explain it in half a slide, and I will attempt to do so in the last four minutes or so. Um, the first thing that you do, I mean, you have a collection of data points. You can estimate the local density of states, rho i, for each sample i by simply counting the number of samples in some neighborhood. So you define a neighborhood function and you count how many sample states I find in my neighborhood. This gives me an estimate of the local density. Next step and next quantity is delta i is the distance to the nearest state with higher density. So this points upwards density gradients. If I would be here, the next highest density state would probably be here and then here and then here and then here. And I can just walk a chain upwards to a local maximum but noticeably at local maxima, the, the distance to the next highest state is very large, abnormally large. So what the algorithm does it is says, cluster centers are identified as abnormally high values of delta i. There's of course some ambiguity and parameter fiddling with what you call as abnormally high, but you can plot somehow the distribution of delta i and there are a few outliers and then there is the whole rest. And you do set some threshold at some value and say, Above this threshold, I, I, I call these things cluster centers. And then every other state is just assigned to be at the same cluster as its nearest neighbor of higher density. So you get this whole tree of which cluster you belong to. Note that, of course, locally here, the data will be rather rough. It's not clear that there will be a single local maximum in this cluster, there might be multiple. But all these local maxima probably have another local maximum comparably nearby. And the one that is locally, the maximal one, in a single cluster will be the one with the extremely abnormally high delta. So this is rather robust against fluctuations. So this we more or less blindly applied to the climate data, to the output of the climate simulations. And this is what you obtain. So this is again, the projection to the same two dimensions, but the clustering is not performed in two dimensions. It's performed in 96 dimensions. So it's not the full 10 to the five, that's too much. Um, it's projected down to 96 dimensions, that's just um, three different heights, the temperature at 32 latitudes, I think. And indeed, this density peak clustering then identifies four um, clusters. One is clearly identifiable with the warm state. One is clearly the snowball state. You have this cold state and a fourth state that we haven't given a name because we can identify it as spurious. There's not a lot of data here, so it's probably just some fluctuation that's abnormal. And if you just start your climate model at one of these points, it will just decay to the warm state. So it's, once you have a candidate, it's rather easy to identify whether it's indeed a locally stable fixed point, because you can just use the forward dynamics to, di to identify it. So indeed, this does recover this cold state. It's still a bit uh, questionable, and it depends on the noise level and depends on all kinds of uh, uh, parameters. But the, the um, random discovery of this cold state is, could also have been made by the density peak clustering algorithm. Is it, if you take states that are in here, they would decay to this locally stable cold third state. So this is uh, everything that I wanted to talk about. What I um, hopefully convinced you is that there are um, a multitude of turbulent fluid models that have scale separation and therefore allow for this split between coherent structures and turbulent fluctuations, more or less explicitly. And that on large scales, um, I have effective dynamics that allow me to define some kind of landscape with fixed points and edge states. And then I can look at transitions between those fixed points induced by fluctuations. So the system that I applied it to are atmospheric jets, pipe flows, um, and climate, but obviously there are many more. And of course, if you're ambitious, then you can go ahead and try to apply the whole machinery of ray events algorithms to these metastatic states. Um, okay, thank you for your attention. All right, well, thank you so much, Tobias, for, for the talk. Let's give a round of virtual applause. I think there's a need to do this. Thank you so much. Oh, really interesting. Um,
I'm sure there might be a lot of questions. There, there are already two questions in the chat. Um, Could you read them? Because it's a bit hard for me to share. And oh, to share absolutely. Them. I think I think um, the first question was um, about a con the relationship. I think it was at the beginning of your talk when you talked about the basins to um, don't the system mm -hmm. systems have some conservation laws that limits what it can do. Um, yes, I believe this was sort of the point in the talk um, where that question came up. If you could comment a little bit about the yes, the role so I haven't taken into laws. account conservation laws at all. In all the systems that I tend to consider, um, the transitions are driven by fluctuations, and the fluctuations violate the conservation laws. So probably I'm not uh, capturing all the subtlety that is underlying this question, but I think the honest answer is that I'm just ignoring conservation laws. All right, excellent. <laughs> Um, the next question is about the climate models at the um, at, at the end of your talk. Uh, what does the heat map coloring indicate in those plots? Yes, this is a, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is a histogram. Mm -hmm. Merely, we collect, I don't know, tens of thousands of states that are decorrelated by taking them with um, large enough temporal distance. And then I project them into these two so each of them represents a full Earth climate with 10 to the 5 degrees of freedom, but I just project them into this two-dimensional plane and count up by one uh, if I observe a state here. Um, then, so th the, the problem is this color bar. So what I can do is, of course, take minus the logarithm of that to get at some kind of quasi-potential-like quantity for this in order to speak of valleys instead of mountains. So if you look at the, I think I errorlessly said that this is a histogram, of course, it's obtained by taking a histogram. But this individual plot is not um, a histogram itself, but it's minus a logarithm of a histogram. Fantastic. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. And then there's a question on, on the clustering. Have you thought about using topological data analysis? Um, I guess very short answer, no. This is um, this is the so I'm not at all an expert on the data science techniques. I figure that maybe this is an audience that would be interested in it, and I'm very open to suggestions in this direction. So in this case, the density peak clustering, which as I say is very simple to uh, implement, worked very nicely. So we didn't even consider looking at anything else. Um, I would be very interested in some discussion, maybe not now, but like, uh, or maybe now. I don't know how much time we have left in learning more about what other kinds of clustering algorithms exist and whether these topological techniques can lead to any gain over what we already have and for what cost. But I, I, I simply must say that this is not my area of expertise, so I cannot say whether this would give you any advantage. Um, like whoever asked this question, would you say that you would gain an advantage in this situation? Yeah, Would well, it be realistic to apply? Chris, do you, do you want to comment or maybe leave it for later well i i'm not i'm not this is chris jones i'm, I'm not really a an, an expert in topological data analysis either but oh, okay, certainly yeah. when you're looking at a sort of landscape it, it seems kind of suggestive because the idea of topological data analysis is based on you know trying to find the sort of peaks and valleys of a morse function mm -hmm. um, you may find situations where there is more topological structure. I, I don't know, just when yes. you said the clustering, that was kind of what came to mind. So yeah, just maybe okay, that makes sense. Direction, so we, but I, I don't have any deep mm -hmm. insight. So we do go beyond the density peak clustering in the paper. I didn't um, present that, but what um, there are these manifold learning techniques that let you learn, for example, the effective dimension of the data, which is why we ended up with the 96 dimension uh, number in the first place, I think. And also, for example, locate also the edge states or the saddle points of the data. It's not quite clear um, why the saddle points in the uh, histogram must be the same as the edge states of the basins of attraction. That's not obvious, I think. But at least you can um, do more than just find local, uh, local maxima and basins of attraction. And um, we did at least compute also presumed um, edge states from uh, with the same technique. So with the same techniques that are ignoring all the knowledge that we have about the dynamics. Fantastic. Yeah, there, there's 
maybe jump we jump to to the probably for this session maybe the last uh last question <laughs> and we'll can always uh, continue the discussion later uh, this is regarding again the last um, system you talked about what are the governing equations used in the last system for the climate model yeah i i would assume so yeah yeah so um this is a pre-packaged software package and it does um georgios knows more of the details and i think he's in the audience so he might in, a, in an open discussion contribute more knowledgeable information than i can but it certainly is atmospheric dynamics in multiple layers um ice coverage um, pressure temperature. So I don't think you can write it down as a single closed PDE because it's too complicated already for that. But it's still not a climate model so sophisticated as the current uh, very high level um, climate models. That run. So this is still small enough that you can run it on a laptop if you are willing to wait a, a day or so. But um, so not a supercomputer one, but it's not simply just as simple as, for example, the atmospheric dynamics where I write down a single PDE and say, that's the that's the fall equation. So so maybe the, uh, the honest answer again is, I don't know the specifics, but it does include a lot of effects, including um, atmosphere dynamics, ice, and um, some ocean heat transfer, temperature pressure, and uh, topological, topography. Oh, right. Great. And actually, there's a comment on there. Oh, the, the chat is now. Yeah, there are more questions. Um, Rainer is um, mentioning the connection for the pipe flow, the connection to directed uh, percolation. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So this is um, well explored. I didn't mention it, but exactly at this balance point, this has been treated with direct percolation and everything that's there. So I'm not sure whether I, I didn't want to comment on it because this is not the direction that I take. There's a lot known about this model, yes. Fantastic, fantastic. And yeah, there may be maybe one more about the climate change model. Mm -hmm. People have studied critical transition in climate state. Did you observe, study, or analyze such tr transitions in the model? So it's not really a climate change model in the sense that this somehow maps uh, like climate change induced by uh, humans on Earth and increase in CO2 and so on. So these traditional works in terms of tipping points and so on, I'm not sure whether they apply to the same degree, whether we would even be able to observe them in such a coarse grained mm -hmm. climate. Model. Um, so we haven't looked at it. This is simply the uh, born out of this curiosity that what happens if you integrate these simplified climate models for a long time and whether you can find additional stable states. So maybe I'm not, not quite sure on what this question exactly aims at, but um, of course, there's a much more fine grained discussion in connection to actual climate change on stability of the Gulf Stream or um, other tipping points or metasta localized metastable points that you can observe in climate as well, and that arguably could maybe treat it with similar methods. But this is maybe too coarse in order to actually observe these. Fantastic. I it has no ocean circulation in particular. This uh -huh. Absolutely. So you wouldn't even know that there is a Gulf Stream. <clears throat> we are sort of right at 11 o'clock now. Um, um, so let's stop. let's sort of st stop this topic here. And maybe if you have additional comments and questions, uh, we'll leave it for later um, in the open discussion. But um, let's now move on directly to the next talk. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Timo Scholler from the U U Ruhr University in Bochum from Rainer Grau's group. Um, this, this talk, um, as I understand, refers to one of the keywords that uh, Tobias Kafka mentioned in his talk, namely instantons, and in particular, um, one of the, 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 the really exciting developments in the last couple of years and uh, with very fresh and, um, yeah, fascinating results regarding um, the pre-factor, but I don't want to say more. Uh, thank you so much, Timo, for, and you have the floor. Okay, so uh, thank you for the um, introduction and, and for the invitation in the first place. Uh, let me share my screen uh, like this. So can you see it? Works well for me. I hope for everybody okay. else also. Okay, fine. So, um, yeah, I, 
uh, in comparison to the previous talk, I will be a bit more technical, I guess. Um, maybe the title already impl implies that. So um, this is basically the content of a recent paper um, that was joint work with, with Tobias Kafka and Rainer Grauer, um, titled Gay van Jagdom type equations for calculating fluctuations around instantons in stochastic systems. And yeah, well, so, so I will be mostly talking about the actual development of um, this method to um, obtain a probability density function or PDF estimates um, in the small noise limit for dynamical systems. Uh, and on this title slide, I have included some sort of sketch of what we are doing here. And I think uh, by the end of the talk, you will all understand what's actually shown here. Um, but first, some motivation. I mean, Tobias already gave some some great examples in the previous talk. Um, so I will again consider turbulence as the um, prime motivation here, and um, but not really in the sense of um, transitions between different um, 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 fixed points of the dynamics, but uh, more like um, in the sense that what we're trying to do is for turbulent systems like the 3D Navier-Stokes equation or simpler models like the Burgos equation in this talk. Um, we're trying to derive theoretically some estimates for um, prob probability density functions of interesting observables of the complicated process. So um, there are many phenomenological theories to do so, to derive something like the PDFs of, I don't know, the vorticity, um, the the gradient of the of the velocity field, or some expectations like structure functions, and um, what we are trying to do is to um, estimate these quantities theoretically based on the equations of motions. So um, to be more concrete, um, I, I will mostly focus on the one-dimensional Burgos equation in this talk um, as an example. So um, with periodic boundary conditions in space and uncertain finite time interval for the most part, and um, which is written down here, uh, with some um, stochastic stochasticity introduced by an additive noise, um, eta, which I will always take to be uh, wide in time and um, correlated on large scales in space by some um, correlation function in chi. And um, well, so this forcing um, models that we introduce some sort of energy on large scales, which is then um, um, dissipated or, or um, 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 uh, where, where which is um, transformed by this uh, by the nonlinear um, PDE here, and resides in some non-trivial output for um, for for relevant um, statistical quantities of of depending on this process. So, what do you want to do? Um, for this setup is um, in particular estimate the tail um, probabilities, the, the tail scaling of PDFs of some physically interesting functions of the process, for example, at the final time here. And, um, and also in particular in the limit um, t to infinity, so when the time interval, beco interval becomes large and we are sampling from the um, invariant measure or the stationary distribution. And um, how does this look like in this example? So um, here on the top left, you can see uh, a particular realization of, of uh, the velocity field in Burgos turbulence. And you see, because of um, this nonlinear advection term, um, the system has the tendency to, to form steep negative gradients and shock-like structures, which, which dominate the dynamics. Um, and if you take a look at the bottom two panels here, these are some examples of relevant PDFs. So the left one, is um, the PDF of the process itself of, of you at some point in, in space. And you see that it's basically Gaussian. Um, so by the way, in terms of notation, um, rho will always be a PDF uh, with an observable function as index, and A will always denote the argument of these PDFs. And now, if you, instead of the of you itself, of the field itself, consider the gradient of you, so um, ux here, then you see very clearly, this uh, the influence of this um, this shock dynamics. So the, the the PDF has has this um, pronounced negative tail here stemming from these shocks, and this is what we actually want to want to estimate um, um, theoretically in a suitable um, limit. 
So um, now to make this uh, more precise, um, in terms of notation, I will work mostly with um, ordinary SDEs um, to make it a bit, a bit more um, the notation a bit more clear. And um, we consider, so in, in Langevin notation here, um, some SDE u dot plus n of u, where n is some deterministic nonlinearity equals eta, um, starting from some fixed initial condition, some deterministic initial condition, uh, with a white and time um, Gaussian noise, which is spatially correlated by, by this uh, covariance matrix chi which is of course then um, symmetric and positive semi-definite as a correlation matrix. So um, this is the case of additive noise, which I'm considering here. So chi is supposed to be constant. And um, I will be talking about the small noise limit mostly. Um, so um, what can we say about the dynamics of, of the process as, uh, as epsilon tends to zero here, as so noise strength tends to zero. Um, so again, um, I, I will be talking about uh, ODEs mostly, but but the extension to, P to PDEs is, is uh, formally formally straightforward, um, and the application I will present in the end will also be for for, SDE, uh, for PDEs, um, namely the Burgos equation. And um, what we're trying to do is to to estimate the PDF rho O of some function applied to the final time configuration of the process, um, which we call observable. So, so some function from Rd to Rd prime, like for example, if we take um, the identity map from Rd to Rd, then we get the PDF of the process itself. Or if we, we could take one component of it or the average or something that approximates um, the uh, gradient in this um, Burgos example. And um, this small noise limit, uh, we, we, we consider this small noise limit in order to um, to make a clean expansion sort of um, about the most um, probable path, um, also called instanton. And um, this is not new, uh, this method. Um, this has been used for quite some time. Um, but, but in particular, I want to talk about um, prefactor estimates as the title of the talk says. So how to actually improve um, existing rough estimates of these PDFs um to make them um asymptotically sharp so that um yeah it's not only log asymptotic but but actually a um a precise estimate of the pdf um i said that in this focus example we are in particular interested in the tail statistics now i'm talking about the small noise limit so how are these two related um so um for, again, for this example, which will suffice for now, I think, um, there's a scaling invariance for the for the Burgos equation. Of course, you can rescale it in um, in terms of a characteristic length scale and and time scale, and then um, then formulate the system in these rescaled variables. This is the way you usually see that it's only um, one one um, dimension is quantity, the Reynolds number number which um, which uh, characterizes the system. So um, in this case. Again, for this gradient example, um, if we want to um, estimate um, the, the PDF at some large value of, of this gradient, then we can actually rescale the system um, based on this, uh, this large gradient value um, by this length scale and this time scale in order to get, well, again, the Burgos equation now non-dimensionalized quantities with um, viscosity one here and uh, a constant in front of the noise that scales as one over um, the gradient strength squared. So um, this is basically some sort of motivation why this corresponds to tail statistics in, um, in this particular example. But again, I will be from now on talking about the small noise limit uh, um, to, um, to make the expansions cleaner uh, in this case. Um, okay, and, and of course, there are also, you can think, think of, of, of multiple um, other examples where, where the uh, small noise limit is, is, is interesting in its own right. Um, so that's not really a severe restriction. Um, okay, so 
I will be presenting um, the contents uh, um, um, from the perspective of um, instanton calculus, so from a physics-based um, perspective. Um, I mean, it is basically a large deviation estimate, so um, the dynamics will collapse to the um, 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 to the deterministic uh, um, um, dynamics in the limit epsilon goes to zero, and we are um, quantifying how it deviates um, as epsilon tends to zero, so it's, it's a large deviation estimate, but I will be um, using terms from physics to, to do so and, and work with path integrals, uh, which makes it very transparent what's, what's actually happening. Um, so I will, I will shortly introduce this. Then um, the actual content of the talk and of the paper on which this is based is um, how do we improve existing, existing, existing estimates? How, how do we compute the prefactor? Um, well, there will be some sort of result that I will state, and then I will provide two different de derivations. So um, one that is traditional in the physics literature, so um, the Gay van Jacklom approach um, that I will explain, and the other one which is um, which is uh, mostly used in, in, in mathematics, I would say, so the Feynman-Katz equation. And um, well, I will I will present both for comparison purposes. And um, this result will actually contain a closed form expression for this prefactor. And then I will show some examples where, where we actually calculated this and um, um, what this actually um, imp improves for this, uh, these PDF estimates. OK. Um, so um, starting from um, this expression for the PDF. So, so um, again, a general observable O from RD to RD prime evaluated at some A in RD prime um, can be written formally at least as, as the expectation of the data function here of O of U of zero um, minus A. And um, this expectation then, um, because U uh, depends via the uh, SDE that I wrote down in the beginning, on the Gaussian noise eta can be written as a um, functional integral um, over all noise realizations. So here you have the data function from above with uh, the dependence on the noise explicitly denoted like this. Um, and the weight factor of the, of the PDF uh, is, is Gaussian, which becomes in the continuum limit um, this integral of minus t to zero um, um, of eta um, chi inverse eta. So um, this, uh, these brackets here denote the scalar product, the Euclidean scalar product in, in RD. And um, here the inverse of the correlation matrix appears. Um, I should say in, in many applications, um, the sky is not actually in invertible. Um, like if you only force a few degrees of freedom, um, like in T Tobias's uh, example um, in, in the previous talk. But um, if you define this carefully, then the whole derivation will really remain valid. So I, I will act as if it was invertible in the, in, in, the, in the derivation. And the result will only be formulated in terms of chi itself, so, um, so that it can be um, directly used for non-invertible chi. OK, but anyway, so, um, so starting from this expression for the PDF, we can then transform from the noise to the process U itself. So um, this would be something like the um, Gersonov theorem in mathematics, or, um, or in, in this case, um, a straightforward uh, substitution in the integral. Um, you get some extra term. But most importantly, um, this quadratic uh, exp exponent here um, becomes this action functional, this onsaga machlup action functional. So um, so you see here, I just, sub for, for eta, I just substituted the left-hand side of the SCE, so u dot plus, um, plus n of u. So this is a quadratic um, um, action functional. Um, I mean, where u itself enters non-linearly, so it's in general, so it, uh, it is a more than quadratic functional in general. Um, and what this tells you symbolically is that you have to integrate over all um, realizations of the process that um, start at the in fixed initial condition and for which um, the observable evaluated at the endpoint is equal to 
precisely this A where you want to evaluate the PDF. Um, okay, now we are in the small noise limit. Um, and well, this epsilon appears here, um, epsilon to the minus one. And um, such integrals are um, can be evaluated with, with um, Laplace's method, which I'm sure you know. So um, just as a remi reminder here, if we have some, in this case, infinitely many dimensions, um, integrals of this form, so some function g of x times e to the minus one over epsilon times another function f of x, and f has a unique and non-degenerate minimum somewhere in this um, domain over which you integrate. Then by expanding about this minimum, um, then you, you can see that in the um, limit epsilon goes to zero. Um, this uh, expression on the left is as intrinsically equivalent to this expression on the right. So um, what this tells you is that you have to do two things to, to estimate this integral with this um, method. So first you have to find this minimum. If you're given a function f, you, you, ha you have actually have to locate this minimum x bar. And then you ha have to evaluate, um, I mean, this part here, of course, at the minimum. But more importantly, in, in this talk, um, this prefactor here, which is the determinant of the Hessian of, of, um, of f, f at the minimum. OK, and this is what we are basically directly applying to this um, functional integral. Um, so uh, I would sketch it like this. So um, first, the minimum um, under the right boundary conditions. Um, in this case, we have to minimize um, a functional um, this action functional to get the minimum action path um, connecting the initial and the final condition. Then um, we expand about, around the minimum. And um, this is what we call fluctuations. And um, this is the influence of these uh, fluctuations is what, um, what I will talk about mostly. And um, then there might be additional complications that I will not talk about um, here. So for example, what if um, the minimum is actually degenerate? So if it's not a, a single isolated minimum, but if it's in an abstract sense looks like this, for example. Um, or if, um, and I will also not cover this, um, if there's um, um, multiple fixed points and you can jump between them, then you would also have to sum over all these possibilities in a um, suitable way. But this is not for today. Um, so I will, um, so, so first uh, the minimum in, in our setup. So um, for each A where we want to estimate this PDF, what we do is um, solve this minimization problem, find the um, minimum of the action functional um, for all such functions that um, start from the fixed initial condition and for which this observable, which only restricts uh, to a subspace of the um, final, final um, time configuration, um, such that this is equal to, to, to A, um, this observable. So um, there's uh, different ways to, to, um, to, to solve such, an cons such a constraint minimization problem. And one pr possibility is to define a um, conjugate momentum, or which would be um, the control variable in, in optimal control, um, like this. Um, so P equals chi inverse times u dot plus n of u. Because if you do that, then the act action functional can be written like this. So just a quadratic um, 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 functional in p. And through this equation, u depends on p. So what this means is given any p, you start from this initial condition, you integrate forward in time by this equation, and you end up somewhere at the final time, and you minimize over all such p, over, over all p for um, for which uh, this, this constraint is fulfilled. Um, so this can, for example, implement it with a Lagrange multiplier, um, f here. So um, what you do is you, you um, extend the functional with, with this, uh, uh, in this way to, to, um, to convert it to an un unconstrained optimization problem. And then if you, um, if you take the, the condition um, for, for critical points um, that the functional derivative with respect to P should vanish, then you get a set of equations that you can solve. So these instant equations. Um, so this minimum trajectory I should mention at this point maybe is, um, is, is called instanton in this context and which is, it, which is borrowed from, um, from physics again, from, from particle physics in particular, where, um, well, mostly um, 
these these um, minima, minimal um, action um, paths that were considered there are very localized in time. So it's actually only there in an instant, so hence and so on. Um, but anyway, so so these are um, the saddle point equations that um, that determine that can be used to calculate the minimum. Um, so if you do that, if you evaluate the action at the minimum, um, then you can expand the path integral around this instanton. And no matter what comes out of the rest, so you, you definitely pull out this um, this um, this factor here, e to the minus one over epsilon times action at the instanton. And um, what this means is that by by only calculating the instanton, you already get this exponential scaling here um, times some unknown prefactor. And well, this is now the, the goal of the rest of the talk to to discuss how to how to um, obtain some sort of um, um, numerically feasible uh, way to calculate this prefactor and in, in, in practically relevant um, examples. So. Um, the epsilon will be um, the the prefactor at, at so the exact prefactor basically at, at finite epsilon, and as epsilon goes to zero, we want to calculate um, z of a, which will be the um, asymptotically equivalent um, um, expression for z epsilon at at leading order in epsilon, and this is what we want to evaluate. Okay, so and I plotted a um, a random a Gaussian process here uh, as a representation of these um, prefactor contributions. And to see this, um, I mean, the, the, the advantage of working with the path integral approach is that it's rather transparent to do this now. It's, it's formally equivalent to the finite dimensional um, Laplace method. So just insert minimum plus square root of epsilon times fluctuations into the path integral, expand to second order in epsilon, and the result is rather <laughs> um, looking rather intimidating, I would say. But um, we can go through this step by step. So here's a, there's a path integral about, um, over all fluctuations now, starting from zero, of course, because the instanton already fulfills the correct boundary conditions. Um, then in the last line here, um, this looks like the um, action function in the beginning, or this generalized on the Machlop action, just with a linearized, linearized um, SDE now. So you, you Previously, you had u dot plus n of u. Now it's delta u dot plus um, 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 gradient n of, of ui times delta u. So a linear SDE here. So this is the whole thing is basically an expectation with respect to this um, a process which fulfills this STEs delta u dot plus uh, nabla n delta u equals eta. Okay. Then you have the boundary conditions here. Like I said, start from zero and end up. Um, well, in the kernel of the gradient at the finite time configuration. Um, that's the finite condition here at this order. And um, then here at the, um, the, the, um, um, the second and third line, this is then um, one term which is um, evaluated along the trajectory of these, this fluctuation process, and one term that is evaluated at the finite time related to the curvature of the observable. OK, um, and just a representation of um, the process. So integrate over all paths will start at zero and end in some linear subspace at the finite time configuration. So how do you actually compute this? Um, the easiest way is, is uh, certainly by, by Monte Carlo. So um, I mean, as I said, this is an expectation of this whole expression here, um, data function. So you want to hit the kernel of, of um, the gradient of O. Um, then some something depending on the final time configuration and something evaluated along the path. So where data u is a Gaussian process um, that satisfies this linear STE here. So of course you can integrate this. Um, you can take samples from this and and average over it. And that's one way to 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 estimate the prefactor. But um, this is not what we're trying to do. We want to want to get a, um, a deterministic method, uh, something that does not rely on Monte Carlo um, methods. But I mentioned this because um, I mean for one. One thing, it's a good comparison um, for the, what we're doing. On the other hand, um, in this way, it's also easy to include high, higher order effects, um, which would make, for example, this, this SDE then nonlinear for 
if you consider higher order, order terms in epsilon, or give additional terms here. And if if this if the nonlinearity and the observable are both um, polynomials, then this expansion um, would terminate at some finite order, and then you have um, some um, sort of important sampling for the um, original problem. Um, just uh, well. Um, Using the instanton to 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 um, hopefully get a more efficient um, sampling of the of the tails. Um, okay, so now the actual result um, for each a where we want to estimate the PDF, we first compute the instanton, and then the prefactor at leading order can be calculated with this formula. So um, this whole thing depends on this matrix Q down here. Um, which is a matrix valued function from the time interval to Rd times times d, um, which solves a matrix Riccati um, differential equation, uh, which is symmetric uh, like this, which is then evaluated along the instanton, so um, which enters here as a background field. So um, this is where um, where the um, a dependence that is indicated here is actually hidden. So the instanton depends on the the final time constraint, and this then enters as a, as a background field into the evaluation of this um, matrix Riccati equation. And this is just an initial value problem, which um, for which you then have to evaluate the, um, this integral along it and this final time contribution, and that's it. So that's actually um, cheaper than um, the instant com computation itself, which um, because of the constraint, you need to use some sort of iterative um, procedure to calculate it. and um, if this does not get too large here, um, this Riccati equation, then it's um, then it is easy to, to integrate and also numerically um, stable. Um, so the thing is, of course, if um, if we discretize a one-dimensional PDE, then this would be a two-dimensional uh, function already. So that's that's okay probably. But um, for higher um, dimensional PDEs, then this becomes um, numerically also um, problematic. If you have a four-dimensional or six-dimensional um, um, field here that you need to integrate, but um, yeah, my my example will be one-dimensional for that reason here, and um, that's definitely a future direction. Okay, so how do you um, prove this? Um, one uh, possibility is is through the scale and diagram approach. Um, this is not new. Um, this uh, is is known since the 1950s and 60s, and um, what this means is basically take the um, Definition more or less of the path integral through a discretization, and just calculate the um, the Gaussian integral. So what do I mean by that? Um, we, we we discretize um, the SDE in in, in time. Um, we um, replace the um, white noise by by finitely by n um, um, independent Gaussian variables, um, and it will be advantageous to consider a whole family of discretizations of the SDE. So not only um, the um, Euler-Maruyama discretization, which, which would be alpha equals uh, zero in this case, but but a more general um, um, sort of discretization. Okay, so in this way, um, through this discrete approximation of the SDE, the UIs depend on, on the eta i's and are also random variables. And um, the PDF, uh, this should be row here, um, um, at some a can then be obtained in the limit of discretization goes to an infinity um, of the final time um, 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 field uh, con configuration um, as, uh, of, of this data function here. And um, I mean, this for, for this um, finitely many uh, um, discretization points, this is just a um, um, multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution here of these eaters. And, and again, UN depends on these eaters. So then if we go through these whole steps that I showed you before, um, then we get a Jacobian from the transform. So, so what we are doing now is transform from eta to U and um, then compute the instanton and so on, or in this discrete setting. Um, in this case, this will give a um, discretization dependent Jacobian in this dis discrete setting. I mean, if you you compute the Jacobian of this mapping here, and this will depend on alpha actually um, in this in this way, and um, the result of then expanding around the instanton um, will be this lengthy ex uh, expression again. Um, so you 
recognize some things, like here's the finite time term with the curvature of the observable. Um, all the bulk terms are in this um, 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 second variation here. And here's the finite time constraint. The, um, this extra Jacobian, which depends on the discretization choice in to this alpha here, um, is of order epsilon to the zeros, zeros power. So there's no epsilon here. So it does not influence um, the instanton. Um, but what we, um, there are still some discretization dependence here in this in this Jacobian term, which will, however, cancel out with the, with the discretization depends of the rest of the integral. So um, this whole discretization thing is, is useful because we will see that one particular choice of alpha is, is advantageous. Um, so anyway, this is now a um, Gaussian integral of some very large dimension, so um, n times n times d dimensional, with some restriction on the last um, of the data ui's. And the idea to calculate this is, is rather straightforward, actually. So um, what you do is you um, you integrate out one of the data ui's after another um, in a chronological order. And because it is a Gaussian function, um, the result will, will always be a, a Gaussian after, after um, after each um, integration of after integration out each each um, individual degree of freedom, so what this means is that you can make an ansatz that it should be um, a Gaussian with a normalization constant, with a covariance matrix, and with a source term um, for for each time step, and then you can obtain recursion relations for these parameters through this um, um, repeated integration, and um, then. If you take the limit n to infinity, these recursion relations turn into differential equations for these parameters, and that's that's basically um, the the idea. And and uh, the calculation is rather lengthy, so I will not present it here. Um, but the result is um, that um, the resulting equations, um, the differential equations, will still depend on this discretization choice, which is then only cancelled by this additional term here in the. Um, um, before the integral. So um, one choice directly um, shows or, uh, um, 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 is, is then um, obviously the easiest if you go through this, um, this algebra, which is alpha equals one. And for this, you, you directly obtain this um, Riccati equation that I showed you for the covariance matrix um, of, of these Gaussians. So it's basically the something like the covariance, this Q, this, which fulfills the Riccati equation, is basically the covariance matrix of the Gaussian process along the instant. So, um, and in, if you have um, seen uh, this somewhere else before this definition approach it's um typically what this does is um it, it relates um the functional determinant which this corresponds to because we computed this gaussian integral which will be the determinant of this variation here of this um, operator in the limit um it relates this functional determinant um to the solution of an initial value problem of a linear initial value problem um, for the same operator. So instead of, so you would define this functional determinant by something like um, like a zeta function regularization or something, where you need all eigenvalues of the operator, but that's, which is really comp complicated. But instead of that, you just have to solve one linear initial value problem. And the, the whole determinant will be given in terms of the solution of this initial value problem, which is basically what we did. And um, we can also make this more explicit here because um, this is, this is known in, in uh, mathematics as the Radon trans transformation. So you can linearize a Riccati equation by, by this ansatz here um, for some matrices data U and data P. If you do that, you obtain this differential equation here, which is now linear. And you can rewrite this now um, basically by, taking, by inserting the second equation into the, um, the first one into the second. Um, you can show that the Riccati equation which we are solving is equivalent to um, to this uh, differential equation here with an operator which is precisely the um, the the operator in the exponent in the path integral that I showed you. So in this sense, solving the Riccati equation is equivalent to to this um, traditional Gaffin-Tacton approach. But the Riccati equation is more um, suitable for numerical integration because if you would, for example, integrate this equation here, then we have different signs here for this um, nonlinearity. So if it is dissipative, um, then um, in one, so then one of the equations is integrated in the wrong direction in time if you if you solve this um, um, differential equation. 
which would lead to exponential growth of the of the solutions. Okay, so now um, I will quickly go through the second one, and um, because maybe that's what you saw when you saw this expectation. So you have um, some expectation, some function of the finite time times e to the minus some integral along the process. So this can be computed by the Feynman-Katz formula. Um, here in the in the forward direction because we start from um, um, this um, from zero in this case so from from um, from zero fluctuations so um, what this tells you is um, that um, you can define some some propagator um, which then fulfills a um, a PDE a deterministic PDE that can be used to calculate this this um, expectation. So this is maybe sort of backwards uh, in, in terms of how it's usually used this Feynman-Katz equation, but um, you can associate this PDE to this expectation here. And um, well, if you if you do this for our pro Gaussian process here, um, then you obtain this PDE. And again, a Gaussian ansatz works. So um, so some normalization constant times e to the minus uh, mu of t, some scalar function of t, minus then a Gaussian term with a time-dependent covariance matrix. And if you insert this ansatz into the Feynman-Katz equation um, and, and uh, sort by, by orders of, of this uh, vector here, then you directly get the Riccati equation for the covariance. And you can obtain some differential equation for this, um, this constant here, or the scalar function here, which you can however integrate using the second one. And um, the initial condition is of course fixed by the fact that we start deterministically at zero. zero. Um, so this is why intuitively the Riccati equation um, starts from zero. And well, you can integrate this, the second order E from U, insert everything in this, um, the expectation in terms of the propagator, and then you obtain just the finite time integral that you have to evaluate. This is just a restricted Gaussian integral over this subspace here. So you can, for example, use the Fourier representation of this um, data function and, and uh, this gives the same result. Okay, so the second alternative is maybe simpler from the perspective of uh, of, of stochastic analysis. Um, so now some some examples, and I will go through them rather quickly because I see I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, so um, th maybe the simplest example that we can look at is this, is this one-dimensional system with a single stable fixed point. So something like, <laughs> like this. Um, so in this case, um, the result for the um, invariant uh, measure for the, for the PDF, for this decimal distribution is, is known. So you take the Foucault-Planck equation of the system um, and, and the solution will be like this, as Tobias mentioned already in the previous talk. And um, in this more noise limit, then you can apply Laplace's method on the prefactor and you get some result here and we can reproduce it um, with our method. Um, so so the exponential term will be given by the instant contribution. So you can um, in the limit t to infinity for the stationary distribution, this separate sort of separates um, and you can integrate the instanton equations and you obtain the correct exponential term. And then the prefactor, this will be a one-dimensional Riccati equation. And I will not go through this in detail, but it will give the um, correct prefactor. And in particular, um, here the prefactor is just a constant. So just um, the second derivative of the potential evaluated at, um, at the minimum. But um, we can still reduce this precise normalization constant. And in general, it will be more complicated. So the prefactor will depend on the observable. Um, and for example, here's a 2G system, some nonlinear and non-gradient SDE. Um, motivation comes again from the Rugos equation, but this is not so important right now. So just some, some 2D SDE um, with a linear observable here. This looks like this. So really it's just an arbitrary example. And um, here on the right, you can see then um, the, the um, PDF um, from numerical simulations of um, this linear gradient-like observable um, for different epsilons, for different noise strengths. And the, um, the lines are just the result of evaluating the instanton plus, um, plus prefactor result. Um, so you see that it seems to match quite well. And to make this more precise, we can actually look at the prefactor itself. So um, um, take the results of the direct sim numerical simulations for, for the PDF divide by um, e to the minus instanton action. That's the full prefactor by definition. And then this should collapse onto the, um, 
our, our result for the prefactor in this monoid limit um, computed um, by solving the instanton Enricati equation. And you can see this is this also um, matches quite well. So um, this is how the solution of the Riccati equation looks like for one particular value of A. And you see that what I mentioned, that this Riccati matrix uh, solution Q itself um, has a comparably small amplitude, the components of this matrix, whereas for the splitting, for the linearization, it becomes quite large because of this reverse time direction. Okay, now to the coming to the Burgers equation. Um, this is all for a rather low, um, a small, small dis, um, resolution in, in, in space, so it's more like a proof of concept, what I'm showing you right now. But um, in principle, what, what I did was, was um, directly apply the formulas from the um, previous uh, section to the Burgers example, where, um, you know, because this is an approximation of, of um, the a PDE, then there's an additional um, delta X for the scalar products. So this, these become integrates in the, in the limit um, discretization goes to, a spatial discretization goes to, goes to zero. And, um, but in principle, it's a straightforward application of, um, of this formalism, which I showed. Um, and I evaluated all terms which, with, um, with uh, pseudo-spectral methods. Um, and parameters as, as shown here. And the result is shown here. So first off, um, the dots again show the result of, of direct numerical simulations for this gradient PDF of, uh, so UX, and um, for different noise strengths. And you see these pronounced uh, left, left tails for, for larger epsilon. And um, the dashed lines are then the result of just fitting E to the minus um, instant interaction to, to, to these PDFs. And you see that it's sort of matches in the tails maybe, um, like in the rescaling argument that I mentioned, um, but not quite. And, and it, it begins to deviate here um, at, at um, smaller observable values. Um, and only for the smallest noise, it's, it's, it's really um, um, good agreement. And if you take into account the prefactor, then it looks like this, so on the left here. So this is just um, directly the, the result of evaluating the Riccati prefactor times e to the minus instant action. And, and you can see that um, even for large epsilon, the agreement is basically perfect, um, except for the um, largest epsilon, which is, but, but this is expected because um, the PDF will not be normalized correctly in this case. Um, I mean, we, we, we acted as if epsilon was small and then as epsilon tends to zero, it will be normalized to one, the PDF that we get. And um, if epsilon is equal to 100, then it, it, it will not be normalized correctly. And you see, if you look, for example, at the prefactor again here on the right panel, that it still runs parallel to, the, to, the, um, to, to, to our, our estimate. So it is still a good estimate, at, even at this large, so, uh, large epsilon. Okay. So the conclusion, um, back to the title slide. So um, what, what I showed was um, how we, so, so this is a, a plot of a, a 2D instanton trajectory starting from some initial condition to somewhere on the green line maybe if we have a linear observable constraining um, the path. And uh, what we did was account for these um, Gaussian fluctuations um, um, around the instanton which are restricted to end somewhere um, in the curve, in this case, perpendicular to the gradient of the um, observable. Okay, so um, what has been achieved so far? So we have a general expression for this uh, linear order prefactor. And in addition to the computation of the instanton, this only requires to solve a single matrix Riccati equation at each point where we want to estimate a PDF. And this is basically useful for anyone who uses this, these sorts of computations, like instanton calculus or activation theory, to, to estimate PDFs. And, and uh, at least for, for uh, certainly for, for, for ODEs and for one dimensional PDEs, this can directly be used. Um, and I showed some preliminary results for the one dimensional Burgers equation, which um, looks quite promising. And what's next? Uh, some, Lots of things, uh, of course. So interesting. It would be interesting to to consider this tra treatment of zero modes. So what if the minimum is degenerate? There already exists much uh, literature on on 
on this um, in the context of the Gaffin Decker method, and it would, would be interesting to try to apply this. Um, and this will be mostly be relevant in higher dimensions, for, so for two-dimensional PDEs, for example. So if we want to do that, we also have to think about how to efficiently solve this um, Riccati equation for higher-dimensional um, um, PDEs. Then there's also the question how to account for maybe higher order contributions than, than, than Gaussian um, or other partial resummations of these expansions. And of course, different applications. I mean, even for the Burgos um, example that I considered here, there's still much to be, to be done. Like, um, like for example, um, um, compute uh, structure functions and um, to, to see really how, how well we can capture intermittency with um, this approach. Okay. But anyway, so the literature is uh, where the paper that was based on, and 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 also um, the second paper, which is also quite uh, uh, closely related, I would say, and um, and the reference then. So uh, thank you for your attention, and and I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Well, Timo, thank you so much uh, for for this great talk, uh, great results, um, really moving things forward here. Um, um, first, let's give a round of virtual applause to Timo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Here we go. And let's open the floor to any questions that you might have. Maybe let me let me jump in myself here. Yeah? Um, so you, you you discuss this finite dimensional model and you I think you mentioned in sort of a side sentence that that is actually related to Burgess equation mm -hmm. did, did I catch that correctly and if so can you elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between that um, truncation and the original Burgess equation uh, how it works on and which features are represented by that model yeah so um um how this this example was derived actually is um, take the Fourier transform of the of the Burgos equation and truncate it at um, at the second mode, so just the first and the second mode, and then to get a two-dimensional SDE for SDE for which you can make nicer plots and so on, um, just uh, just uh, take the um, anti-symmetric part of the Fourier modes, so um, just the imaginary part of the Fourier coefficients. And um, this is how this model was derived. And um, that's basically the whole motivation. Um, and you, I mean, you, see, you can see that, um, that um, the tendency towards the left here for this observable is, is sort of like the gradient PDF in Burgas, but that's, that's all that survives for this uh, low dimensional approximation. Um, so it re really just any, non-gradient, low-dimensional uh, uh, SDE. Um, um, so this uh, Vogas motivation is not not so so uh, important here, I think. It, it still sort of pres preserves the idea that the left tail is sort of more pronounced yes. or yes. stronger non, yes. non gaussian mm -hmm. in, in, in a certain sense. Excellent. Um, other, other questions? Comments? Um, hi, so I'm Georgios. Timo, excellent. Um, just a quick uh, question. So you require to know a priori um, the instanton configuration and then to apply your um, algorithm or no? Yes, yes. So it's it's basically an additional step to the usual instanton computations. So, so once you have the instanton, you, you, you solve this Riccati equation along, along the instanton trajectory. Okay. And and so you have the instanton and then you solve it along and then you do once per chosen um, gradient. So, it, so because it's mm -hmm. instanton is associated with a certain, okay. Yes, and yes. Then you do it uh, and then you scan the whole. Nice. Thank you. Does, does your uh, instanton have to be a localized uh, Perturbation? No, no. 
No, so I, I mean this will usually be the case, especially in the in the long long time limit. But but this is not a um a restriction for this formalism. So 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 what what determine if you have a what do you call an instanton? Does it take a finite time to go from one point to other to the other? What is the definition of instanton? So so as a definition here, I would check just the minimizer of the of the action function um, for the given boundary conditions. And it doesn't matter if you have a barrier to go through or anything. Mm, no, not 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 really. Not okay. so. I mean, in in that sense, it makes more sense to speak of an instanton. Um, but but. Um, yeah. No, I I think it's a kind of a generalization. Oh, anyway, it's a very nice idea to use it in such circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look at the Berger's equation, yes, you have in mind something. Uh, uh, which describes this instanton in terms of the physics of the system, or this is just in the equation, you try some solution and you work with it and then. Um, so these instantons will will represent some something relevant to the dynamics. So for for example, for this Burgers example, um, um, of this. Uh, for example, you know, you, you look for example at the, the situation where you have a single minima and then you know, I, I don't understand. You know, it's uh, I thought instanton always is something which has to do with the with the topology or you know something. Ah. Uh, uh, so so topologically, this is this is sort of the trivial um, um, situation where you have a single exactly. fixed point and and then connect from the fixed point to to some some final um, um, condition. But mm -hmm. but. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. And 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 what I wanted to mention is that um, these sol instanton solutions, um, um, they they are represented in the actual dynamics of the STE. So so for example, for this gradient example, the um, instanton um, configuration will lo look like a shock if you go to stronger and stronger yeah. gradients and you com compute the instanton for these strong gradient values. It will look like a like a shock, and you can actually average. Um, and determine that from averaging over um, over um, direct numerical simulations of the system. So if you could compute the conditional average of, of how does the um, velocity field look like at strong gradients, then this will look like the instanton solution. Okay, so does it mean, for example, that you have to have a nonlinearity in your equation? Mm, no, if it's linear, then then you can. The, but you then you are not going to have any. Yeah, to get such shocks, you need to have some nonlinearity. Yes, yes, to, of, yeah. of course, yes. Okay. There's one more question in the chat. I don't know, Timo, whether you can see it about the alpha parameter and how the alpha parameter disappears in the end of the result. I think that's the one, your discretization parameter, yes. if I recall correctly. Yes, yes so I think. Perfect. Um, this second uh, variation of the action in this discretized setting will depend on the discretization. And the determinant of this huge matrix in this discretization setting will, will also depend on this alpha. And um, this is then canceled by this by this factor here so so if you if you go through the derivation of this differential equation for these parameters and, and basically evaluate this integral then you get the solution in terms of an alpha dependent differential equation and if you if you multiply this by then this this additional factor then this will cancel out um, and how does it disappear mm. I don't know. I mean, I don't have an um, intuitive <laughs> explanation for that, um, except that the result should, of course, not depend on the discretization here. And um, this is how, how this works in this case. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Excellent. No, I think. I think yes, thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Perfect. Any other questions for now? Just I want to add. Um, Please. <laughs> Very briefly, I mean, um, this Riccati equation is super because um, you have uh, this nice properties also for numerical simulations, but um, because it stays bounded no? and um, then you do the Radon transformation, 
you have this numerical difficulties of going backward and forward. However, if you do the Radon transformation, and, and imagine we want at some time later in the future, we want to apply to 3D Navier-Stokes, and we would have a resolution of whatever, let's say 1000 mesh points in each direction, then it would be hopeless, no? there's no way. So we either have to use, and there are existing methods to um, do numerically those um, Riccati equations, high dimensional Riccati equations, or think about this radon transformation, because then it's a small system and many, so it trivializes, it paralyzes trivially. So that's if someone has ideas, uh, information, we would be very much interested. That is the next thing, because of course, um, you can imagine that we would finally like to apply this to big systems and to 2D and 3D. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I'm sure there will be a little bit of a discussion also after the afternoon talks <laughs> later. So I so I hope that everybody will, will be able to join us also for the afternoon session. If there are no more questions right now, I'd say um, let's take a break. Let's have lunch. Uh, so thanks again uh, and welcome also. Uh, welcome from my co-organizers, Eric Van Aiden and uh, Tobias Krachke. Thank you so much for joining us for the second part of our symposium. So again, in this afternoon, we have two talks, uh, one by Marie-Lou Gabrier and the other one uh, by Georg Stadler. And then at the end, we'll have uh, still some time where we can sort of informally discuss, chat, brainstorm, and hopefully you'll be able to, to stay with us for the whole time. Uh, right now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Marie-Lou Gabrier from the Flat Iron Institute and New York University. And um, really looking forward to this talk. You have the floor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the organization and yeah, giving me the opportunity to discuss this recent work. So uh, it's work that I did with uh, Grant Lotzkoff and Eric von den Eiden. And it's going to um, take maybe a bit of a different approach to what we've heard this morning uh, in solving, I mean, in accessing rare events, in going more on the numerical sites and using sampling techniques. Um, so it will resonate a lot with the machine learning keywords also of the, of the, wor of the workshop. And we are gonna be able to assess relative input importance of metastable states and even drive the systems towards uh, rare events of interest. Uh, and and um, you'll see this uh, unfolding along the talk. So, I mean, just to start again with the, with the general context and a bit the way we are going to approach the things, the systems that we are going to have in mind are high dimensional probabilistic systems um, that we typically built from knowledge of, of uh, microscopic interactions. So we can think of uh, molecular configurations where we maybe know of two conformation of interests, but we would like to know the relative importance of each uh, one of them. And we are building a model that is going to build on the knowledge of all the different atoms, the electronic and steric interactions between the atoms. And we want to make sense of all of this at once uh, when studying the, the macroscopic uh, uh, importance of, of configurations. So of course, that's something that is going to arise in statistical mechanics a lot. But in any of the type of probabilistic modeling uh, that is on, on those kind of assumptions, so we can think of of Bayesian models, such as the one here that is sketched that corresponds to predicting uh, the quality of the water of a lake, and it will take into account wind speed, lake temperature, etc. And um, if, if I would have been very bold, I would have even changed during the lunch break my example to have uh, the climate models uh, that Tobias discussed this morning here, because that fits perfectly. And I think it will be a great topic actually of discussion right after, I mean, after this talk. Um, so. Okay, we have those, those uh, macroscopic models and they correspond to studying then the state of a random variable that is in possibly very high dimension. And we have access to a density that they defined. Uh, most of the time we don't know the normalizing constant, but we can write it as a Boltzmann distribution with respect to an energy. And in any way, uh, 
if we want to do exact computations, uh, this is in, intractable and we have to resort to uh, Monte Carlo methods in order to approximate any value of an observable we may be uh, expectation that we may be interested. Okay, so I mean, of course, there are settings where you can do stuff analytically, but that's not exactly the kind of settings we will be interested in. We'll be here in the case where, well, what you can do is, is simple, basically. So when, the, when your starting point is this unnormalized density, then one of the key methods is simply to do Monte Carlo Markov chains. And uh, most of the time, you will resort to local moves. So here I'm just reminding quickly what is the Metropolis Asting algorithm, where basically one chooses a way of proposing updates. So for example, you can think again of this molecule and we are going to propose uh, locally to uh, rotate the, the functional groups of, uh, along the, the chemical bounds, uh, for example, to, to explore the configurations. So we are going to propose updates of, of, of configuration and then we are going to accept it or reject it according to a ratio that is going to depend on the probability of the proposal, as well as uh, the target density that we have at the starting and at the end point of uh, the proposed move. So that's uh, fairly general. And of course, using this Metropolis Asting under uh, some, uh, I mean, we are going to ensure detail balance. And so with ergodicity on top, we, are, we can show that the algorithm is going to converge towards the target distribution that we are interested. However, um, if we can only make those type of local moves uh, in the presence of metastability, we are going to that it's that we have uh, stable locally stable states that are uh, separated by energy barriers. Then we are going to uh, have yes a good acceptance. So we are going to progress, and the, the algorithm is going to allow us to progress because this ratio is going to be close to one. But we will have bad decorrelation. Uh, basically, the samples we are going to obtain will have a weak statistical power because they are very correlated. And that is because the time that you should wait to cross this barrier is going to scale up exponentially in, the time, uh, in time with respect to the barrier. So that's, that's something you can always do. But when you are trying to sample from modes that are very far apart, this is uh, impossibly long. So, of course, now can we just have non local moving instead in order to mix between the modes? Well, if you think of systems that are complex in high dimensions, they are going to have be very hard to design to have good acceptance because basically we need to jump in a, in a state uh, of high probability and we need to know how to do that. And basically, this is what we are going to tackle in this talk. And what we are going to use are those deep generative models. So um, I'm, I'm not sure how familiar are people with deep generative models, but the basic idea is that now with the technology of deep learning, of deep neural network, we are able to learn parameterized uh, transformation that are going to, to transform samples from a, a simple distribution, uh, easy to manipulate, to, to samples of a more complex distribution uh, that we are interested in. And here, for example, uh, so I'm calling the transformation T theta throughout the talk, and theta stands for the parameters of this uh, uh, parameterized map. And here, for example, you have an, uh, some Gaussian white noise that is being transformed uh, little by little by such a map into the image of a dog. So this is something that uh, we are now able to do with, with those um, deep generative models. And if you want, we, what it parameterizes is an effective density that is parameterized by the map, and we'll come back to that. So now, of course, to do that, you need to be able to have trained your transformation. You need to find such transformation that is going to uh, change Gaussian noise into uh, the image of a dog, uh, for example. So uh, one, so this is is going to be uh, made possible by the training phase of uh, the deep generative model. And there are actually many different types of such deep generative models. But one way of training them is going to be minimizing the coolback Leibler divergence, which is some kind of distance between the target density that we will be interested in and the one that is parameterized by the deep generative model. And 
equivalently, because of course, I mean, we, we cannot even evaluate this, this uh, uh, perfectly because in general, we don't have access to this rho star of X. And what we have is only a data set. So instead, what we are going to do is have some empirical approximation of this max of uh, this Kullback Leibler divergence. And so in a set of examples, so you think of this as being a set of images of dogs, we are going to compute the log, okay, the negative log likelihood here, sorry. So the minus the log of the probabilities that the model is assigning to, see, to seeing those data. And we are going to choose the parameters that are going to uh, make the model likely to have generated those data. So that's the, the, the general paradigm. And so they are able to, to act uh, on, on very high dimensional uh, systems and they are able to mimic distributions in, in very high dimensions, potentially quite complex, right? If you think of uh, the manifold of images of dogs. And the natural question that arises then is, can we use neural networks to learn non-local MCMC moves. So it's actually a topic that has uh, a lot of, of people working on right now. Uh, and there are lots and of different investigated strategies. For example, some people are trying to learn uh, effective Hamiltonians that will be uh, useful in uh, running HMC, Hamiltonian Mon uh, Monte Carlo. And then there are people that are using so the generative models I was just mentioning directly. So parameterizing high dimensional uh, uh, densities, either to learn a transition operator. So this, this P of X plus uh, of X at T plus one knowing X at, at T. So in the jumps in the, in the metropolis asking, if you want, or alternatively learning directly the model, uh, uh, I mean, the target's density. And, uh, and here it's, it's a setting that is a bit different from, from what I was just dis discussing and that is traditional in machine learning. In machine learning, what you have is access to a lot of data and you are going to try to mimic those data. Whereas here we are in this context where we have a probabilistic model, we have a rho star of X, which probably we don't know the, the normalization constant, but we don't have data. This data is precisely what we want. We want to sample from it. But that's the, exactly the, the approach we are going to discuss here. And give, if we have the possibility of learning uh, to model the target density, then these deep, gener these deep generative models are able to provide us with a very efficient way of generating independent samples. And so you can picture it as if you are going to generate with the neural network independent samples in either of the modes, for example, when you are back to these metastable systems that you are trying to mix. And you are going to be able to jump uh, very efficiently between, between the two of them. So that's the general idea. Now we are going to have, in order to go through this program, uh, overcome a few challenges. So the first one is that in order to incorporate a neural network into a, a Monte Carlo algorithm, we need to have we cannot just have a, a black box that is going to generate something. We need to know uh, precisely the probability that, that the model is uh, assigning to the, to the models, to the samples it generates. So, I mean, we'll see this, this technical issue that is actually non-trivial. And, uh, and then of course, as I was, I was just hinting at, in order to be able to realize such a program, we need to be able to train the generative model uh, to start with, so to make it to make sense of, of the target density we have, although we don't have a priori samples and samples that are, are precisely what we are trying to obtain. Okay, um, and I forgot to say, but of course, do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have any questions, if anything I'm saying is not clear. Um, I'm very happy to answer along the, the lines of the, of the seminar. Okay, so the outline of, of the presentation is, is going to be the following. So first, we are precisely going to um, focus on the methods and about, and I will describe you a strategy for assisting sampling with training, where we are concurrently doing the training and the sampling. When, when we will have uh, uh, been over these methods, uh, we are going to look at what we can say about this method, what can be analyzed about it, and 
how do we use it then to, to uh, compute some, some Monte Carlo estimates of expectations we may be interested in? And finally, we are going to scale up what, what we have done and look at applications that are um, virtually in infinite dimensions uh, when we are trying to sample continuous fields, so um, in field theories. OK, so um, what the type of neural networks that we are going to uh, use are uh, normalizing flows, which are inter invertible neural networks with an easy Jacobian. So basically, they are parameterized maps. So this is this T of theta that I was uh, mentioning. And they are going to go from, from one space to the same space, since they are invertible. And we will have a base distribution. So that's a simple distribution that you are able to produce independent sample from easily. And then we are going to compute the, we are going to transport the samples from the base distribution by the map. And those samples will be effectively uh, um, distributed as the push forward distribution. Sorry. As the, oops as the push forward distributions uh, of, uh, of the, the, sorry, of the base through the map, which takes an explicit expression because the map is invertible. So we are able to compute what is the probability of each sample that is generated by the map, thanks to just uh, the, the formula of change of variables of densities, thanks to uh, the invertibility of the map. But okay, so we need a parameterization that is invertible, and we also need it to have to be able to compute efficiently this term, which is the determinant of the Jacobian of the inverse map or the map. I mean, that's a bit equivalent. And here, what I mean, people have thought very hard about, about doing this uh, in different contexts. And what we are going to use are coupling layers, which are precisely uh, uh, transformations that are simple, but that will provide easy to compute inverse and Jacobian. So how does it work? If you have an input uh, layer X here, you are going to partition it into, into, so you will have X1 on one side and X2 on the other side. And the way that you are going to transform uh, those data is by keeping one uh, the same. So the output of the layer Y2 is going to be equal to X2 for, for this half. And on the other half, you are going to compute a, a fine transformation, which is going to have coefficients that can be arbitrarily complex uh, functions of the half you are not going to touch. So you will have S theta of X2, that basically is going to be parameterized by a neural network because it's a very flexible transformation. And then you will have a translation, a part that is also going to be parameterized by a neural network. And if I mean, this, this coupling layer, which is this T of theta of X, if you want, is easily invertible because when you want to go from Y to X, you basically just, you know X2 because you know that it's equal to Y2, and then you just need to invert an affine transformation to uh, recover what was the value of X1. So you can see that it's, it's uh, implementing something that is easily invertible. And if you think about what's the Jacobian of the transformation, you'll see that it's actually, oh, something I, sorry, I forgot to say is that um, S and T here are functions that are going to be in the dimensionality of uh, X1 to the dimensionality of X1, and they are going to, uh, well, sorry, from X2 to X1. And here, when I'm taking a product or, or an addition, I'm doing uh, operations component-wise. And okay, and then I can invert component-wise, everything is working fine. And so if you think of the uh, Jacobian of the, of the transformation is going to be diagonal and computing the determinant of the Jacobian, then it's going to be very easy and you just need to uh, uh, compute the product. So those layers are, are perfectly, uh, I mean, this parameterization is perfectly fine, but um, arguably what you should be telling me is, wait, what, what can you do with, with an affine <laughs> transformation? Uh, I mean, how could you generate a dog with an affine transformation? from Gaussian noise. Well, of course, you're not going to do that once. You are going to um, do that many, many, many times. And by composition, you are not going to lose either invertibility nor uh, I mean, ease in computing the Jacobian. And you will just have to stack everything that you are doing, every operations. So that's, uh, that's the, the parameterization we are going to use for uh, the transformation. 
And using that, we can uh, reload our Metropolis Asting and use the normalizing flow to propose non-local move. So if I'm just writing the, the algorithm to sample from a target density, I will have initialization x0, and then I will loop the, the following operations where I will propose a move, but I will propose it without actually taking into account the starting points. And I will just sample from the distribution uh, that is encoded by the normalizing flow. So I will have just a rho theta of x t plus one, that will be this, this proposal probability. And then I can accept reject uh, through the metropolis testing criteria. And again, this is possible because I can efficiently compute this, uh, this density thanks to the architecture I was just mentioning. And I mean, okay, so what, what, what should this be good? Well, um, okay, so, okay, so, so, and this will, will be good if you have a good acceptance to start with and to have a good acceptance, this means that you should uh, have a row, I mean, this, this ratio that is not too small. And this can, is typically um, uh, realized when we have actually that the row theta is going to mimic the row star. So we want to have to parameterize the density that is going to model the target density, as I was saying, to ensure good acceptance. But we'll also have a second possible problem here is that the, the algorithm I just presented is just going to propose new states based on uh, the normalizing flow. And so if the normalizing flow uh, is not able to reach all the possible states that are relevant in the, in the target distribution, then we are not going to be able to explore everything that, that matters. So in uh, implementing our algorithm, we will need to think of two things to remedy this, to use also local Monte Carlo moves uh, so that we don't only rely on the quality of uh, the model we have. And of course, we are going to, to try to still have a, a, a model that is going to become better and better uh, such that we have a good acceptance in our uh, non-local uh, resampling steps. Okay. So what's the, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing pieces together uh, little by little. What's, the, what's going to be the, the, the algorithm principle? Then it's going to have this, this concurrent training and sampling, as I was saying, where we are going to have first some local sampling that we know how to do, that is going to start to generate some data. The data can then be used for initiating the training of the map that is going to parameterize the density that we want uh, to be as close as possible to the target. And as the training is improving, we are going to be able to have some non-local resampling steps that are going to be accepted. And these non-local sampling steps can be taken as new initializations for local sampling steps. And basically we are going to have better quality of the samples we are using, we are generating that will give us uh, a better signal to train our models that will give us even better ways of mixing in the systems. And you can see that this, this is going to uh, have a, a virtuous feedback loop. And you can, again, look back at this, at this image to uh, picture what's going on. We are evolving locally. And then at some point, we are going to ask the, the neural network to generate a random configuration. And maybe it's going to be able to make us jump, and so on and so forth. So maybe one thing I should uh, mention uh, quickly uh, for people that may not be familiar with deep learning, the way we are going to do the training is through gradient descent. So that's really the, the, the basic algorithm that is going to be used in any training of a neural network. And the idea is that, again, we have data. So here the data is going to come from sampling. And we are going to compute the negative log likelihoods, which corresponds to computing min minus the log of the probability that the model has generated those data. So of course, the better is your model, the, the higher the probability you will have had to generate the data you want to mimic. And in order to maximize this, this likelihood or to minimize this negative log likelihood, you are going to take gradient steps. So update the parameters of your map along the gradient of these uh, leg, uh, log likelihoods. And, and you are going to use some what we call a learning rate or a learning step uh, to update iteratively those parameters. So that's, that's those are 
all the ideas and now I can just put them all together in the algorithm so that you have everything uh, written down properly. And so we have, I, I remind you that the objective is going to be to, to uh, um, sample a target distribution. And we are going to make use of this push forward expression that is parameterized by a normalizing flow, this T of theta with theta being the parameters that we are learning. And from initial value of chains, we are going to have uh, several steps combined. So we are going to have non-local resampling that is going to consist in drawing from the base, pushing forward through the map, and then accepting or rejecting uh, the, the newly generated configuration based on the metropolis asking criterion, if we look at what was going on right, right before. And then, uh, so that's, uh, that's the first thing that you are going to do at each iteration. Then you are going to combine this non-local sampling with local sampling. And here, for example, we are using uh, Langevin dynamics. And again, this is going to help you if your map is not good and you are not going to have a good acceptance ratio, you are still going to be able to um, have moving chains because the, the local steps are still going to happen. And you will also be able to explore uh, places you haven't learned yet to represent. And once you have uh, moved in those sampling uh, iterations, you can take the data that you were uh, you just sampled and compute the gradients of the likelihood to update the parameters of your map. And you are going to repeat and repeat this operation. And that's, that's basically uh, uh, the whole algorithm. You can think of variance. You can uh, run multiple steps of either gradient descent or multiple steps of collecting the data. And I think there are a lot of questions of what's optimal here uh, that are still open and, and um, nice venues for from some theoretical analysis here. And maybe also a comment compared to what's what's um, in the literature. So this relates to what's called uh, adaptive non Monte Carlo methods that are going to take into account. Uh, what has been sampled uh, uh, up to a certain point in order to design transition kernels as at uh, the next points. And here it's doing so by also taking advantages of the great uh, power of generalization and approximations of neural networks that are going to be able to model directly very complex distributions. So that's the whole idea. Are there some questions? Actually, if I may, I, I do have a quick question. Uh, so, but is there a chance that, uh, let's say you have two basins, right? Is there a chance that you're always stuck in one and you'll never discover the other one because the local steps don't make it ever out and that's why the, the, um, the neural network is also never never learning about this thing? Yes, so let's, let's just uh, move to the next slide because this is what it's about. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so let's, as a first example, let's look at uh, a small mixture of Gaussian, of Gaussian in two dimension, where we, we are going to have two uh, modes of two components of this Gaussian, and one is going to be twice as likely as the other one. If we are sampling using only local methods, such as uh, Langevin dynamics, right, we are going to be able to, so, sorry, I should say, I, here I initialize two random walkers in each of the, of the basins, and I just like make them evolve according to the local dynamics. And of course, we are going to, to, to explore each of the modes well, but if we would like to wait for transitions between the two, it's going to take a very large amount of time. And of course, in, high, in higher dimension, it would be even worse. And uh, basically, the, the samples are never going to real, not never, sorry, in a reasonable time, the samples are not going to realize that one of the two modes is twice as likely as the other one. Now, if we do the, the concurrent sampling that I was just uh, men mentioning, but if we start with only walkers in one of the modes, uh, here I have one walker in, 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 the, in this mode, and here what you see in color is uh, the density that is modeled by the neural network. So at the beginning, um, I don't know if I can, uh, yeah, maybe I can, can I restart the film? Yes, okay, at the beginning it has uh, no, nothing to do with the target, but since it's seeing the, the samples that are uh, being uh, generated in one of the modes, it's going to uh, move towards this mode. And as we are moving towards this mode, the initially only local Langevin steps are going to be mixed with some uh, Monte Carlo larger steps. Uh, sorry, Metropolis asking larger steps. 
that are due to the proposal by the density. But exactly as you were mentioning here, uh, if the if the, the problem has no idea that there exist several basins, um, there is no uh, exploration uh, going on that, that will be able to find the, the metastable states. So really what you should be very careful about is to initialize in both basins. And in this case, you will see that the density that is modeled by the neural network at first knowing nothing about the, the, the mixture of Gaussian is going to little by little learn it. And it's going, and we're going to see that the chains are going to exchange rapidly between the modes. And we are going to see that the mode that is twice as likely is going to appear twice as likely in, in, the, um, in the training. And if you run longer for longer uh, the training, you will find that the outcome of what you see is very close to what you were trying to, um, to you were not really trying to learn it, let's say, but uh, what, what you are using as a surrogate to, uh, to do the resampling is going to resemble very much the target distribution. But you're totally right that uh, there is no exploration that is, that is going on and you really should think of it as, uh, so I guess that's also why it, it resonates with, with uh, only certain types of applications. So in the, in the molecular, uh, uh, for example, drug discovery or, or this, this type of things, often you know about an unbinding state and a binding state, and what you want is to know the relative um, uh, importance of both. And this is more of what, what you should be thinking about, that you know of uh, configurations of interest, and what you want to do is to jump effectively between the two, two or the five or what, how many you are. Okay. Um, okay, so that was the first example and the whole idea. Now, uh, what can we say about such a method? And uh, yeah, let's start with the, the analysis and also the Monte Carlo estimators that uh, arise naturally from the methods. So in studying these combined sampling schemes that has local steps, non-local steps and learning, uh, we can try to reason about it taking a continuous time analysis. And if we were to only look at uh, the Langevin dynamics, uh, that would be, uh, uh, you would write for the stochastic differential equation, the instantaneous evolution of the density of the particles that is going to be uh, given by a focal point equation. Now, so we have those local steps uh, that here are Langevin dynamics, but it could be something else if you have uh, systems where it makes sense to do something else. And then you are going to add on top uh, those resampling, non-local resampling steps. And uh, the idea is that you are going to transition from X to Y at a certain time by proposing with the density that is parameterized by the neural network and accept it or reject it with the metropolis asking. And if you are not going to Y, then it means that you are going to stay at X. So you will have uh, the other, the other uh, term in the, in the transition kernel. And you can also uh, write this down then uh, in the continuous time where here we are fixing a certain rate at which uh, this resampling is going to happen. And we are either gonna kill a particle because uh, we are going to have accepted somewhere else, uh, something else at, at Y, or we are going to uh, draw a new particle that is then according to the density of the neural network uh, because we accepted something that was coming from Y, uh, uh, from, from the, the instantaneous uh, transi uh, density at rho of rho t. So we can write down, uh, if you want, this continuous limit of the evolution of, of the density. And uh, then we have a combined dynamics uh, for the overall density when we are doing both types of steps. And we have, so the Langevin part and uh, the global resampling parts of, of the dynamics. So, if we are to, in order to have, uh, to say something about, about uh, the convergence, so it's very hard to take into account the fact that the row of theta, so the, the density that is parameterized by the neural network is actually going to be learned. But making the assumption that we have perfect training, which means that the neural net that is being trained on the samples it's seeing is going to perfectly reflect the density uh, that it's seeing. So this amounts to having this row of theta that is equal to the in instantaneous row t. Uh, then if we don't even take into account Langevin, but only take the global resampling, we can say that the conversion is going to be exponentially fast in the sense that it's a bit technical, but the inf 
about uh, on all the configurations of the ratio between the instantaneous density and the, the target density is going to go to one exponentially fast. And if we add the Langevin terms, so now if we consider the, the entire uh, dynamics, it can only be accelerated by, I mean, this, this rate can only be accelerated by the Langevin uh, terms. So we have an idea of the convergence, but here it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's very interesting, of course. It would be very interested, interesting if we can really take into account also the learning and the feedback. And that's, uh, I mean, uh, place for future works. And uh, I mean, if, if anybody is interested, that's uh, definitely some things I'm happy to, to discuss. OK, so that was for, for what we can expect in terms of convergence. Now, uh, how should you go and uh, estimate expectations now that you have this sampling scheme? Well, there's actually two strategies. Uh, the first one is, well, precisely to use the unbiased samples from the target that we obtained by the combined uh, sampling. So again, this combined sampling, uh, so once we have trained our map, is just going to take into account to use the, the global sampling with the normalizing for density and the uh, local moves. And then we are just using, I mean, the, the traditional Monte Carlo estimates that is going to be unbiased because we have the Monte uh, Metropolis uh, as uh, uh, step that is going to make sure that the, the target is the one we are wishing for. And the variance is going to be controlled by the decorrelation, which hopefully, if the learning is successful, is going to be actually quite fast. And, uh, but there is another method, since as I was showing on these two dimensional Gaussian, you have learned a density that is actually quite close to the one you are actually trying to, to uh, to sample, and that is that you can use the density that is parameterized by the normalizing flow to do important sampling. And you will just directly sample a bunch of configurations independently with the normalizing flow. So that's that's really the, the advantage of it. It's just that you can sample uh, uh, the base distribution that, for example, I didn't say, it, but for the two-dimensional Gaussian, it was just a, a, standard, a standard normal distribution. So it's very cheap to have a lot of independent configurations. And then you push them through the map, and uh, you know what what's the probability? It's the the, the push forward uh, of the map, of the base through the map, and uh, you have your your important sample re-rating uh, factors that are comparing the target with what you actually generated, and uh, you can write down uh, an, an approximate uh, an estimate of the of an observable by just taking the weighted the weighted average uh, according to the important sampling uh, weights. But of course, then the quality is controlled by the overlap that you get in what you have learned compared to what uh, you are trying to target to to sample in the target. And uh, yes, yeah, and then, um, technically it's also also uh, only asymptotically unbiased, but that's just uh, because of important sampling. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, you kind of have these two these two strategies, and depending on on what you expect uh, you have learned on on. I mean, on the problem, uh, either can be can be the most appropriate. Here, just uh, in the in uh, uh, I mean, a basic uh, application that is of, of of very high interest is indeed inst estimating free energy differences, and you can think of uh, I mean, precisely also the the model of Tobias of this morning of uh, we have this snowball and we have the 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 actual climate that we are in and we want to know what's the relative weight of. Uh, the climate of Earth being in one state or the other, and we want the stati statistical weight of them. Or we can think also on my more pedestrian example of the Gaussian mixture with these two modes. And uh, if we use either of uh, the, the methods that I was just mentioning, so either using the samples or uh, doing important sampling, you, you will see. So, what we want is to find uh, so the, the 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 dotted lines are uh, the, the the true ones uh, because you have one that is twice as likely as the other so we are uh, expected this this ratio and uh, what you have here in the y axis in the x axis sorry is the time of training so basically what you are going to see is you are going to have different artifacts at the beginning of training depending on what you choose to do but you will see the model converging to uh, to the stationary uh, uh, correct value as your training and your sampling is improving. So that's uh, that's I mean, that was that was in, in this in, in this two dimensional example. 
Now, in the in the remaining time, uh, what I would like to discuss is uh, basic is is going to higher dimensions, and uh, in particular, what we have uh, investigated uh, are uh, field theories, and see how we can leverage those methods uh, so to sample uh, systems that are much more complicated than just uh, these two dimensional Gaussian. So the idea of scaling uh, field theories will be that. Uh, what we are going to be interested in now is, is phi, which is going to be a function from Rd to Rd, um, continuous most of the time. And this function will have a distribution, will, um, um, a draws of this function will have a, a Gibbs distribution with this time and energy that is going to be a functional of the field. And uh, we are going to consider both the phi four or stochastic Allen-Kahn model uh, where we have a scalar field over 1D space and uh, in, interestingly, um, I guess what uh, we have seen is that we are able to look at uh, relative importance and, and of, of uh, states without having to, or, or, I mean, without having to have considerations about how we go from one state to the next, uh, which was which which can be sometimes also the, the question actually of, of interest as it was this morning. Well, here you can also look at these methods as allowing you to compute statistical weights of transition paths. So we'll, we'll see. So uh, the first, the first uh, model was this, uh, uh, what I'm going to call phi4, where basically the, the energy functional is going to be given by uh, this uh, action where you, by this, uh, this, this, uh, this functional where you are, you are going to have a local potential uh, of uh, the function phi that is going to go between zero and uh, one. And the, yeah, sorry, it's the value of phi. So uh, we are going to have, here I should have x that goes from zero to one, sorry, in my integral. And then we have a, a local potential that is going to encourage the values of phi to be either equal to minus one or plus one. Uh, so that's the expression of the uh, potential. And we are going to have a, a coupling term here that is going to take into, uh, into account the gradient of phi. And that term is going to encourage neighboring values, neighboring positions uh, x, that is going to encourage that phi at neighboring position x have similar value. And uh, we are going to consider the Ricci boundary condition. And this means that we are going to consider models that have configurations that correspond to these blue lines. Here I have a few examples of them. It seems that there are three uh, different configurations that are going to be so bound at zero and one to be zero, and then that are going to either transit through plus one or so minus one as they are confined by the potential. So we are trying to uh, sample configuration of this kind, and we are trying to understand what is the different statistical weights of either one mode or the other. And uh, in doing so, so we, with this form formulation, uh, we are going to uh, use the normalizing flow as I was describing before. And the question is, what should be the base distribution from which we are going to sample in order to then push it uh, through the map uh, and, and get the samples we want? So, Traditionally in machine learning, very often what we choose as a base distribution for generative models is Gaussian, uh, Gaussian distributions. And here we could use so uh, the equivalent, the, uh, the, the continuously uh, equivalent, and that's what I'm going to call the Gaussian uninformed base measure. But actually we can do better and we can incorporate in our base distribution the coupling term. So we can have, uh, we can have here in the in the base distribution this coupling term that is going to encode for the fine scale interaction in uh, the densities that we are trying to um, to uh, uh, sample, and if we do that, so the the next slide is always taking a lot of time to load because there's a lot of lines. To, <laughs> I mean, uh, I should have put the the pictures are in PNG, but they are in PDF, and uh, I'm paying the price now. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Here it is. So those those and then we can we can uh, uh, compare what we are going to obtain as configurations if you are using the uninformed or the informed uh, um, measure. So for the uninformed measure, this is what we are going to 
be able to sample as we are progressing along the training and sampling. Um, and what we are seeing is that, okay, so at the beginning, we don't know anything that's normal. And then we are kind of starting to see what's the, what's the, the configuration we should be uh, um, sampling. But here, actually, I initialized the workers unevenly in the two modes. And I've only put 10% of the workers in the plus one mode and 90% of the workers in the minus one mode. And we can see that it's not at all able to recover that actually the model is symmetric and it should be 50-50 because basically it's not accepting any of the configuration we are trying to, uh, we, are, so we are generating. So they, they kind of look good, but actually they are not good enough at all in terms of the energy that they, they incur uh, in the target distribution. Whereas if we are using the informed uh, base distribution, then we are going to see that very quickly in the, in the learning, we are going to be able to have uh, configurations that look like we want with the right statistical weights. And indeed, if we look at the acceptance ratio along the iterations, it's going to, I mean, at the end of training here, it was around 60%. And if we would be more patient, it would go higher. And uh, here, for example, what I'm, I'm drawing is, is like one single chain of 10 steps. Uh, and you can see that it has mixed in between the modes uh, um, uh, very efficiently. Uh, that's towards the end of training, of course, because at the beginning it's, it's harder. So when, I mean, what, what I just uh, gave you uh, uh, the, the, the consequences is actually the need for the absolute continuity with the targets of the, 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 uh, the densities that we are parameterizing. And basically, if we are, uh, looking at the acceptance criteria or looking at the Kullback libel divergence that we are using for training, we are comparing this row star with this row uh, hat, with this row theta, sorry, that is parameterized by the network. And it corresponds to looking at the difference between the target energy and uh, the log of the, of the um, parameterized density. And if we um, write this down, we are going to have this coupling term uh, that here, we are also going to put in the base measure. And so if we initialize with uh, a, a transformation that is close to identity, basically those two terms will compensate and we are going to be able to have something that uh, um, has, there are some overlap with the densities that we are trying to compare and uh, we are able to initiate training and, and from there uh, we are going to have training that is only going to improve uh, the map. And the map that we need to Learn also is not as complicated because it already has inside uh, the information about the, the fine scale structures. So uh, we can check that it's indeed the case. And uh, here, what we are comparing is uh, the Fourier modes. Uh, so as a function of the, the, so the, the amplitude of the different Fourier modes. Uh, and in gray, I have uh, what I get if I take samples from the targets and I, could, I look at what is their power spectrums. In blue, I have uh, what I obtain if I uh, realize the program I was mentioning where we put uh, the coupling terms in the base. And in green, you have the case where you don't do that. And you can see that basically at uh, high frequency modes, you are failing to capture the right information. And this is why basically you are not able to generate uh, convincing configurations. So that's, that's one very important ingredient. And once we have put it in, we can do interesting things uh, such as estimating free energy differences, uh, as I was mentioning. And here, for example, what we can do is uh, add to uh, the energy functional uh, biasing local fields that is going to bias here, for example, if we take B to be positive towards uh, the minus one mode, and we can compute uh, here with important sampling, the difference between uh, the free energy of the of one mode and the free energy of the other modes, and uh, here it's uh, the the curve in in, in red where uh, we are getting to pretty intense differences in free energies as we are uh, changing these local fields. And interestingly, here we didn't even have to retrain the model. We just take a model that has been uh, trained at b is equal to zero, and we use it as uh, to do important sampling at different value of the fields p. And we can check for uh, the accuracy and the, I mean, the, the, the relevance of our uh, important sample scheme by looking at the variance of uh, the estimates we get 
and up to up to this point, it gets it here since the modes are not changing too much in geometry, they are mainly changing in statistical relevance. Uh, this is a, this is a winning strategy, and you are able to uh, efficiently compute those those free energy differences. Um, I'm I'm running a bit out of time, so I'm trying to uh, speed up the, the two different the two uh, remaining examples I'd like to show, and uh, that are. I mean, I guess this is where my connection to where event is coming. Right here, we are going to uh, have a, a field that is going to to make one of them uh, much much uh, one of the modes much less uh, probable than the other. But uh, and we were able to compute the free energy differences. But what you are also able to do is to bias directly the measure that you have in order to sample unlikely configurations that you may be interested in. So here, for example. We take the same, still we are in the same model, the FIFO model, and we are going to add a Lagrange multiplier and a constraint that is going to constrain the average value of the field to be equal to a phi bar. And instead of having phi close to one or minus one, we can take it to an intermediate value. And basically, the model is going to learn that what it should generate are uh, configurations with boundary walls. And here you can see that at the beginning, so that's the initial of the beginning of the training when the model doesn't know anything about what it's supposed to generate. You can see that early on in the training, it got one of the modes. But as soon as we initialized, uh, we did our job uh, of in initializing chains in both modes, it's going to eventually recover. And we are going to be able to generate the two possible configurations that corresponds to having a mean value of the field of a given, a given value. So that's one thing. And just I have one last slide about examples, which is what I was mentioning about having transitions pass, where, uh, I mean, formally, it's, it's, it's actually not that different at all as, as the model I was just discussing. Uh, but here we are considering a, a stochastic differential equation where we, have, we are going to have a starting point and an end point. And we want to know what is the relative configuration of uh, one the, the relative statistical weight of taking one pass or the other given that maybe we are driving the system with so one pot potential which is uh, given in color here which is a small uh, mixture of gaussian but even if we are adding maybe non, non uh, conservative forces in the mix and uh, we have again the given that we are uh, assuming some some gaussian noise we have uh, a gaussian like measure also for the different paths and using the same strategy, we are able to uh, generate those paths in the, in the two possible channels that we have to go from point A to point B, either the short short length uh, channel or the, or the taking a detour. And you can see again that as training is progressing, we, have, we are having an acceptance that is going to be near uh, 50 or 60% uh, with this strategy. Again, at the price of choosing the right Base distribution. Okay, so um, it's a, I mean what what I discuss is is, is a set of I mean, a, a method and, and and ideas that are actually have really high potential of speeding up Monte Carlo uh, simulations where we have this this state where we know where basically are the best things we are interested in, but what we know is to what we want is to learn how to mix between them. That takes it advantage of, uh, of the great progress in deep learning uh, to, so to, to make this, this connection. So our work is actually still in preparation and uh, hopefully it will be uh, in the upcoming days and on the archive uh, uh, with, with Grant and, and Eric. And I mean, there are many uh, avenues for future work towards the methods. We are interested in, in further con convergence warranties, but there are also a lot of things to explore in terms of the role of architectures, of the strategies for training. And of course, there are also a, a lot of very exciting uh, um, uh, place for, for uh, applications and, um, and the study of phase transition, I mean, molecular dynamics that I, I mentioned, but for example, the, the climate models, I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that would be also interesting. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm very excited and happy to chat with uh, whoever's interested as well. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for running a bit long, and I would be happy to answer any question. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Exciting work. Um, let's give a round of virtual applause. Mary Lou, thank you so much. Fantastic. 
we have time maybe for one or two quick questions. And again, then after Georg's talk, there will be a little bit more time to discuss more. Maybe one or two quick questions now. So I'd have, have one if no one else wants. Please. Um, so if I understood correctly, you are very strongly depending on the fact that your T map normalizing flow covers all states, right? Uh, or that you, with your initialization, make sure that you hit every local minimum. Yes. So you need to know. Well, so you need you need to you need to make sure that the so you have those chains that you are going to evolve all throughout the training, and they are going to take advantage of the map that you are learning, etc. Mm -hmm. But those chains from the beginning, they need to know of the of the beta stable basins because. I mean, of course, you are running a, a local Monte Carlo, so you could, by chance, eat uh, a, a new basin. But that's that's. I mean, there is nothing that is guaranteeing you that you would, and and in high dimension, course, it's uh, yeah. very unlikely that you would. So my question is, I mean, there's is there any quantity that you could look at in order to measure how how high quality your estimate is, or is there any any way that you could notice that you are missing something? So it's, it's, it's actually very hard because you are, you are, if you look at your acceptance ratio, it's not going to tell you that at all, because if you have missed a mode, you have, you have missed a mode. And you don't know what's the, the I mean, in terms of the, of the uh, um, cool cyber divergence, for example, that you are estimating during the training for, for, uh, for improving your map. Well, you don't know what's, what's the, you are getting rid of the unknown normalization constants. And so you don't know what it's, it is its optimal value. So and I mean, you are saying even if you miss a mode, you will get correct the relative stability of the modes that you don't miss. Yeah, I mean, you would what you would you would be able to know what's the relative stability of two modes. Yes, you are so able I'm to having a bit of a hard time of giving getting that in agreement with a non equilibrium system, where somehow if you miss out a mode, maybe that's the important direction in which you need to go for the backward transition or something. But you never really talked about non-equilibrium systems anyway, so maybe it doesn't apply at all. So, um, I mean, in the in the last example, we have... Uh, yeah, but this have... is in path space. So there it's technically in equilibrium, right? Because this is the... The path space measure yes. is again like... Yeah, a yeah. Potential. yeah. So, um, yeah. But I, in I your climate no, example, no, no, it I wouldn't mean, you're be. Right, you're right. I mean, here we are, we are sampling... I mean, we are definitely sampling equilibrium. So, and we are not, we are saying nothing about dynamics in this talk. I mean, yeah. So okay. So so then maybe the climate example must be taken a bit more carefully because that's I mean, certainly non-equilibrium, right? I mean, you're talking about trajectories in climate. I mean, you cannot. You it wouldn't tell you anything about trajectories for sure. I mean, that's that's. I, I, it's no, but a, relative it's stability. Difference. Yes. Sorry. About relative stability for non-equilibrium systems. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, okay. I'm um, I'm wary of saying something wrong here. Okay, uh, yeah. but I no think worries. Maybe it's, we can no, it's very nice. Later, it's it's very nice of, of uh, I mean, I, I, let's let's chat and let's uh, sort that out. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Um, again, there will be time also later uh, to discuss. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of interesting ideas and thoughts. Um, we are right on target. <laughs> Wise. So um, let me now introduce uh, Georg Stadler from New York University. Um, thank you so much for, for being here. And again, um, after Georg's talks, we'll open up the discussion. We can certainly discuss all a little bit more and brainstorm where to go from here. So uh, Georg, you have the floor. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for sticking around. Um, so it, uh, I, I will show you something that is related to uh, a lot of the stuff I saw earlier, but it's also taking a little bit a different perspective, I think, because uh, I, I don't come from the SDE direction uh, originally, so I come more from an optimization, large-scale computing optimization, uh, um, Bayesian inference, so a slightly different, uh, different uh, pers uh, direction, so, um, and so that's kind of the direction I take. So hopefully that's going to be some interesting, uh, interesting there for you. And I'll try to make connections to the previous talks because it's really actually kind of well connected everything. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about is, uh, yeah, as you can see, it's uh, again extreme event uh, probabilities uh, in in something what's what's called what I call complex systems. So it's it's similar to what um, uh, Tobias Tobias Grafke talked about early in the morning. Um, 
Uh, and I'll also point out a little bit of a difference, the differences. So uh, again, Eric is one of the collaborators on this project and Shen Yin Tong, who is a, a, a PhD student at, at NYU in the math department. Uh, and okay, let me jump right into it. So, uh, okay, so I'll, 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 I'll start with the slide. This is, this is, so this, some of these slides were made for, for a more general audience, but in this audience, everybody, uh, everybody already uh, drank the, the, the extreme and very event Kool-Aid. So I guess that's all kind of uh, straightforward here. But um, let me maybe point out what's a little bit different here. So uh, um, what I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna talk about a map F that's, that's involving my complex dynamics that maps some random, some randomness, some random parameter theta uh, to some scalar quantity. And this map can possibly be quite complicated. So in my case, it's always gonna involve a solution of a, of a PDE. And this parameter map is not necessarily like a, this, this theta, this, this uncertainty is not necessarily like a, 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 a white a right hand side white noise or something that um, it comes from that direction. It can actually be something that's, that's um, a, a parameter field that has cert a certain distribution that enters differently in my system. And my systems are often uh, not SDEs, so they're usually, um, they're usually PDEs. And so, uh, okay, so this is a sketch. So I'm sketching here, obviously this looks Gaussian, uh, but some things depend, rely, for some things I need that they're Gaussian, for others I don't. So I'll try to point it out, but my sketches are often like Gaussian-like because that's just easy, easier to, to sketch. So there is some distribution and I'm interested in distributions in high dimensions. So I'm drawing them in 2D, but obviously I, I, wanna, I wanna be able to do something in high dimensions. And uh, uh, F maps it to a scalar uh, one dimensional density. And I'm interested in the tail distribution, tail probabilities as, as many of you are here. And maybe I should mention there's one difference to, for instance, uh, the, the uh, results that uh, Tobias uh, showed in, his first, in the first talk today. So my Fs here are not as complicated as his Fs. So I wanna make it clear. So uh, this is, um, it, you don't think of it necessarily as there's like some tiny uh, theta distribution and the F makes something turbulent. So my Fs are kind of nicer. So they're mappings that are, um, they're nonlinear in general, right? But they're not, um, the, they're not as, as chaotic behaving as like turbulence, for instance. Okay, so I wanna make sure my Fs are kind of nicer and my, the F I'm gonna use for most of the, um, the for, for the main example in this talk is actually the F that has to do with the shallow water equation, which is the equations that model, um, the uh, wave propagation uh, in, in a shallow, in, in the ocean basically. And that's interesting for tsunamis, but uh, that F is not as crazy as uh, turbulence in, in Navistokes. So it has certain nice, nice, nicer properties. In particular, my F, I will need derivatives of this F first, or maybe even second derivative of this F with respect to the parameters. Okay, so that's the channel. By the way, uh, you're very welcome to interrupt me too. That would actually, um, make it more fun for me. So well, you're welcome to do that. Um, so, uh, okay, so the target is to estimate as always, we wanna estimate the, the measure of the extreme event set. So we measure, measure we wanna measure the estimate, the, the measure for this set. And these are, these are all the parameters theta such that the event outcome is larger than a certain threshold. Okay, that's, that's, these are the rare extreme events, right? And the larger this set gets, the, the more unlikely they get, so the rarer they will actually. So it's this measure this set is the same as saying you want to compute the probability of, of, of being larger than, than this set, larger or equal than this set value. Um, so this is basically just saying the same thing again. This is the, the probability to measure. And so to make the connection to maybe uh, what, um, what, what, was the, what, what occurred in other talks. So in other talks, um, you make the, the event you have an epsilon parameter usually that it's the noise level, right? And you, for epsilon to zero, the, the, it's harder to, it becomes more, more, more rare, right? So basically for less noise, then the transition probability becomes much smaller, okay? So there's no epsilon in my formulation. So the, the role of the epsilon um, is here, the, this value Z that goes to infinity, that makes it more rare, right? So because I'm, I'm gonna say for Z uh, to infinity, this, this, um, this set here that corresponds to the parameter values that lead to this somewhat extreme outcome, right? If I make that larger, this, I'm gonna have a new omega of Z, right? So it maybe might look like this, Let's see if I can color this. So if I make, this is for a larger Z, so that's, um, that's for, yeah, so that's for a larger set. So this would be the set uh, omega 
of Z, the set omega of Z1, right? And that's, um, that has less, uh, a lower measure, right? Because it's, it's leading to more, more extreme events. So it's actually harder to, to randomly uh, draw a, a sample if you think in terms of sampling in this set. Okay, so there is this kind of uh, connection where we are using, uh, so we're gonna, I'm gonna try to make connections to large deviation theory uh, where classically you're in this case, but we're using it in a slightly different context. And that's actually also based on, on, on work that uh, Tobias uh, Grafke did also in collaboration with Eric like uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so, okay, so there is this like, whenever I say set to infinity, and if, you, if you're not used, used to this, then you can also think of epsilon go to zero. Okay, so there's this, this connection here. Um, okay, so this is my slide where I'm trying to say why these events are important. There's no need to say this here, obviously. Um, so so we are, there's all these uh, extreme extreme things that happen. We care, we care about them because they are unlikely but important. And okay, so this, everybody agrees with this here, I assume. And so I will use uh, tsunamis as my my extreme or my yeah, my somewhat extreme event. But the the approach is somewhat generic. I would need certain properties, as I said, where uh, I need certain nice niceness properties of of my of this map F. Okay, but in just uh, but the method has nothing to do with tsunamis. That's just my my toy problem here. And um, so this is also aiming to make somewhat connection between probability estimation and optimization. Um, if you're used to thinking in terms of this, this um, large deviation theory, that's kind of natural. Um, and I wanna just emphasize that that's obviously, again, for, you, for, you, for, most, for many of you, that's kind of normal, but that's, that's not a natural connection, right? Because in general, the most likely point of a, of a distribution of a density, right? Is statistically not really that important, okay? So points, point, point estimates in general of a, of a distribution are in general, they don't really tell you much about the distribution. Uh, and then there's this difference is there's this, this connection, right? So optimization, we are pretty good in doing optimization for with some constraints for nice, relatively nice functions, right? Optimization in high dimensions is something we know how to do. Okay, mostly I'm, I'm over generalizing, but we kind of know that how to do, right? But obviously high dimensional statistics is something that's fundamentally difficult, right? It suffers from what's called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, doing anything kind of has to do with probabilities in high dimensions is fundamentally hard. This, I think we are most agree on that. So the question is, in what cases can we actually make connections? Can we use tools from optimization, right, for probability estimation? And that's exactly cases uh, that have to do with these um, with these rare or extreme events. Okay, and that's this connection that large deviation theory makes. And I know, and so that's how I initially also got interested in this, coming from more from an optimization perspective to kind of make this connection, really figure out when this connection can be used to do something interesting from a probability estimation perspective. Uh, but in general, I mean, in general, again, um, these two things, optimization and, and uh, probability estimation, they're quite different. They, they, they don't really have, there's not, no trivial or no direct connection um, in general. Okay, so these are the takeaways. So I'm gonna show you the slide right away and I'm gonna show it again at the end of the talk to double check if you, if you agree with those or if you paid attention. So, um, so um, the goal is to, to come up with these methods uh, that, that, um, that work in these cases where you have certain regularity, certain niceness properties of this map F. These methods are ideally supposed to be insensitive to extremeness, so they should not fall apart um, as you go more extreme, that's set to infinity, right? Because that's what I'd like to have. They ideally should work for high dimensional parameters, right? I, I have these, these sketches in two dimensions, but I, I care about high dimensional problems usually. And uh, they, they're, they're supposed to work for expensive and high dimensional uh, um, mappings. So I call these F things, the map from the parameters that theta to the event, okay? So, so, uh, so my Fs are always gonna involve a solution of PDEs. So F, just evaluating F um, will, will take some time, okay? So in particular, um, you can maybe use sampling methods, but you can think of F, F, Fs that where just uh, evaluating F for one parameter theta can take seconds, minutes. So, so it's a non-trivial mapping F. And so I'll, I'll make some connection to large deviation theory um, and argue the connection in this case to these optimization problems in, in, a, in a certain case. Uh, as I said, you know, the parameter, this, this mapping F is nonlinear and I need derivatives of this map. Okay? And so for instance, for, for certain problems, that's hard for, if you do climate problems, uh, you might not even have, you might not have access to gradients of F with respect to the parameters. 
And I'll show you a method where you don't only need derivatives, and you also need second derivatives of f. Um, and uh, my main toy problem will be this tsunami problem, where f involves a time dependent shallow water equation. And that's what I want to show you now. So this was kind of the math overview. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, about this, this application problem. Um, I'm not claiming to actually, uh, yeah, as you'll see, it's, I'm, I'm solving tsunamis, but still in 1D. We're working on making it in 2D. So then it's actually, it's actually more like a real tsunami. But um, just to remind you what causes a tsunami. So a tsunami, we had a couple of very um, impactful cases in the last uh, 15 years. So what's causing a tsunami is the following. So um, in plate tectonics, so in regions where plate, plates move at a, at a very slow rate, a couple of centimeters per year, okay? And there are regions where plates subduct each other. One plate pushes uh, underneath another one in the simple, most simplified way. And to read that there's a stress buildup over, over long time scales, right? And every so often, every 10, 20, we don't know, 50 years, right? This stress gets released uh, and we experience an earthquake uh, because of the, the, the seismic waves. So these are seismic waves that get generated by this, but at the same time, what happens is that the, the, um, the ocean floor um, also changes, gets uplifted or downlifted in some complicated pattern as an effect of that stress relief, right? It, depending on, and this can be, uh, I'll show it in the next slide, anyways. But as a, as a result of this um, um, ocean floor change, right? The whole water column above it gets lifted or pulled down, right? And that generates some kind of wave uh, somewhere out in the ocean. And that wave then travels at a certain speed uh, as a uh, that depends actually on the depth of the ocean here. It travels towards uh, land, right? And in land, we experience that as a tsunami. And we all, we all know that this can have uh, very serious uh, consequences, damages, loss of life and all these things. Um, so these tsunamis are caused by the sudden up and down lift of the ocean floor uh, due to uh, this, the earthquake, which changes the bathymetry. The bathymetry is the, the depth of the, of the ocean. Bathymetry is the same as topography uh, out in, 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 the, in water, it's called bathymetry. Out on land, it's called topography. And I think there's a sign difference, but that's basically what it means. And um, yeah, these waves, as we know, they can travel very far. And so, so there's sometimes there's can travel and depending on the distance from this event to the to the city or you're looking at um, uh, it takes a certain time until the waves to reach them so that's the basic mechanism and uh, okay uh, let me show you how these these up and down lift patterns typically look uh, across from a tsunami so this is the up and down lift pattern that was reconstructed after the Sumatra 2004 earthquake which led to a huge tsunami and so just to give you some ideas, so this is the, the, the colors illustrate how much up and down lift you get. So red, red is actually an uplift of up to like four meters. Um, and blue is a downlift, goes down here up to two meters. And you can kind of see that that's a complicated pattern of up and down lift because it depends on how this slip between the plates happens. And uh, sometimes there are patches where it sticks. So you get these quite complicated looking um, patterns. And um, um, they all look basically like this. They all look kind of smooth because they're caused by something that is, happens in, inside the, the, the crust, right? Inside the, inside the earth. And they're hard to predict. And yeah, they're hard to predict because they depend on uh, the, the slip faults and geometry and stuff that we don't really know very well. So this is what causes it. And this is what's gonna be my theta, by the way. So my theta is gonna be this parameter that describes these so my this random parameter that describes these um, up and down uh, um, up and down changes of the topography. Um, so so this is uh, a, this is a part of the ocean in front of the of, the, of Japan uh, outside on, on the coast of Japan. So um, so this is at the big subduction. So this is where the Pacific plate subducts underneath this this plate here. This is uh, where the 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 earthquake happened and the tsunami happened in for 2011 for the, that led to this um, huge uh, problems in Japan. Uh, if you slice through it, okay, so now I'm gonna make, so this is where I make my two dimension tsunami one dimensional uh, <laughs> to simplify it, but um, we're working on the two dimensional case. So you make a slice through this and then look at this slice, it looks like this. So you see, this is the plate that pushes underneath it. This is what's called the overriding plate. And uh, the, the, the town, uh, Fukushima or so, would be somewhere here, right? 
Okay, so this is the distance to shore here. And you see, actually you don't see, but this is a couple of hundred kilometers. It's fairly close here. Uh, and so this is how it looks, the geometry looks, looks like. And, um, and I simplify this thing and I make it look like this. Okay, so this is inspired with this geometry. Uh, and um, so the, the actual slip occurs here where it's green, right? This is, this is where the actual slip stress release from the earthquake happens somewhere here. And it leads to this up and down lift pattern somewhere above here. And then, uh, okay, this blue is obviously the water. And then these waves here, they'll travel to shore. And on shore, I will record them and I record them in this red region. And so this, this, this whole uh, process from, from starting from the theta that lives here as the, this uh, um, non-predictable, hard to predict kind of um, up and down lift pattern through the solution of the shallow water equation, through the wave reaching here on shore in these red regions where we could think of, but that's where the city is. That's my map that maps from these parameters theta, this pattern to my, my, my quantity I'm interested in. And the quantity I'm interested in is gonna be here, the, the, the um, average water height. So you can think of it as, the, as the, the, the strength of the tsunami, how much water gets being pushed towards shore. And uh, what's the physics here? How do I model the, the wave traveling from this region to, to shore? It's modeled by this equation, which is a shallow water equation. It's the 1D version of the shallow water equation. That's a hyperbolic conservation law uh, that involves the, the height of the ocean and the velocity here. And it's a nonlinear equation. So uh, here it's linear, but these here are nonlinear terms. So it's a nonlinear uh, equation that, that uh, makes the waves propagate from from, from somewhere here in the ocean to shore and also to the other direction. Right? Uh, you have some boundary and initial conditions here. Um, and let me show you how this in principle looks like. So uh, this is an over, over, overly simplified problem. So here we have a huge wave that is much bigger than, than it should be. It's also plotted in a bigger way. So this, this up here is just a zoom in of the, of the stuff below. And then later, so this is the initial lifted water column and then with time it starts to travel okay and in this very simple case so what you can see is it travels left and right right and in doing so it kind of interacts with the ocean floor the ocean floor um it, it starts to travel faster when the ocean is shallower and also like it steepens up it's a nonlinear equation so it's it steepens the wave front steepens and actually can develop shocks um as it uh, as it travels okay there's some non interaction and depending on and it the, the ocean ground influences how the wave kind of uh, um, makes it to shore. And also like um, these waves are actually, you, you, can see, you can see the uplift wasn't that, that much right in the plot I showed you. Maybe it was one, two, three meters, okay? I mean, okay, I guess that's still much, but then when it, uh, when it travels to shore, it builds up and, and actually its height increases. It gets compressed and its height increases. And that's why tsunamis are particular, uh, are so, destructive, even though out in the ocean, they are actually, the water is, is only lifted by a meter, but the tsunamis can still be very strong on shore because it builds up and gets compressed and the water height, the additional water height uh, increases quite a bit. And you can basically see this here, this is later in time. So here the wave uh, went through it. And if in the zoom in here, you can see actually there's some, um, there's some reflection going on here. So it's, it's a somewhat complicated interaction with, with the, the ocean ground, the ocean floor. Okay, that's 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 the last one. Uh, that's the physics. So uh, so I've told you um, how to what my uncertainty, what my randomness is, the theta, right? You can think of it that's like uh, in an SD context that would be the fluctuation, but here it's a random field in some sense. I've told you what the the f mean, what what f is, which is kind of the starting with this. I should have mentioned by the way. Sorry, let me go back one thing. Sorry for that. Uh, so I should have mentioned that in these equations, the the this 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 pathema change here enters here as if as a the gradient of that enters here on the right hand side of the equations. So that enters on the right hand side of the equation. You solve the equation over time and space, and then you uh, how do you measure it? What's your observation on shore? And the observation on shore is is this quantity here, which is um, this is the 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 uh the water height on on shore and i'm interested in this red region here okay i'm only going to look at this region this is the water height of the water b0 is the reference bathymetry and h is which is has a negative sign and h is the actual water height so this is the extra water height this would be like three meters 
And I'm interested in the average water height in this red region. So CD, that's exactly, so this is this red region here. And then I, I'm not sure when the waves get actually gonna be arrived there because um, its speed uh, depends on the depth of the ocean, okay? So that's why I'm interested in actually taking the maximum uh, overall over the times I'm, in, I'm simulating. And so that's my F of B, right? So that's my, the map, the, the uh, parameter to event map is that thing, right? Start here and then solve the equation and then take the maximum over time. That's the thing I'm gonna measure. And uh, if you, you can imagine that this maximum here might cause issues because this maximum is not smooth in the sense and I need certain smoothness. If you want to avoid that, and we can do both. We can either work with the maximum directly or we, we smooth it out. And this formulation here is just a smooth version of that maximum. So the details don't really matter, but just think of it to get rid of this maximum or time, you, get, you can write it like this, which kind of is an approximation that is smooth of, of this time maximum. That's just for, for uh, that makes it uh, easier possibly to work with. Okay, so that's the example. This is just showing more of these patterns uh, of, this is just showing you how this, so the slip occurs down here and that leads to this hard to predict pattern uh, on the ocean floor. And this is just more data. So um, where you, they actually connect these slips that happen in this somewhat unpredictable way with the corresponding patterns on the, on the, on the, uh, of the ocean floor. So, so that's it. Okay, so, so that's the, the long intro. And now I'm gonna um, talk about stuff that uh, many of you probably know really well. It's uh, trying to connect um, extremeness and optimization. Um, and so again, so this is the probability one estimate. Now I've explained what F of B is. So also I should mention that uh, theta my parameters, okay? So that's gonna be this, this field, right? This, up, this field of up and down, um, changes of the bathymetry. In the application, I call this B. B. So it's it's in the abstract presentation, I call it theta, but theta and B is kind of the same thing. Uh, theta when I talk about in general and B when I talk about for this tsunami problem. So these mean really the same thing in my, in my talk. So uh, yeah, so um, this, is, this is the probability I want to estimate. And um, for this B distribution, I will assume uh, multivariate Gaussians, but then I also talk a little about uh, how to do how to deal with when that's not the case. And um, so we're connecting. Um, the idea is to kind of um, make this connection to large deviation theory. Okay. Uh, and yeah, and 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 yeah, connected to large deviation theory, and uh, to help us to estimate this probability. And so this is the, the whole story in a nutshell. And I think uh, many of you are also somewhat familiar with this. So we want to estimate the, uh, this is the extreme event set again. So we want to estimate the measure of this set. And then um, the, the thing that plays a role here is the, the rate functions, I of B. Um, so that, that comes into the, into, into the action principle. And this rate function is just something that depends on the, the underlying distribution for these parameters B. And in, the simplest case where um, if, so if, if this parameter B is really a multivariate Gaussian with some mean and some covariance matrix, right? So we, we have finite dimensions here. Uh, then this rate function is uh, just the, 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 the negative log likelihood of the, of the Gaussian density. So it's this quadratic form um, that you can see here. You can compute these rate functions uh, also for, for more general um, distributions. It doesn't have to be Gaussian, right? And then, it, then it's not true that the, the, negative log, um, the negative log of the density is the rate function. That's not always true because also the rate function is actually always a convex function. So it's always something that's a convex function, it depends only on the underlying distribution. And um, it can sometimes be computed analytically, but sometimes you, can, you have to rely on numerical uh, you have to do it numerically because it's hard to find closed form expressions. And then um, um, what are we interested in? So we're interested in uh, actually minimizing the rate function, okay, over all these parameter values B that are in this, in this purple or red set that lead to a, a, a tsunami of, of, of replication of a certain size. So that's the, that's the large deviation minimization problem, which 
is basically the instanton problem if you take the physics route and kind of um, the physics perspective and kind of uh, accept that uh, this notion of noise to zero, epsilon to zero is somewhat similar as the z to infinity for my case. So then this is this is really kind of this is really kind of just what's called as the instanton in in in, in physics. Right? Okay. And then uh, and we've also seen that in in uh, Tino's talk in the second talk. So then uh, what this gives you is this, these optimized solutions, they allow you to write this probability uh, in this form with this exponential term where uh, on the right-hand side, this instanton shows up, okay? And then this prefactor and the goal is to, so so the, so this is already nice that tells you, that tells you the, the rate and this prefactor is kind of sub exponentials and then it's kind of about estimating this prefactor. Okay, and the, the large deviation theory gives us not this gives us um, a relationship for the logs of these two things, right? That's this thing. It tells us that it goes to, to one. Um, but we're actually interested in actually uh, having actually estimating this this prefactor um, um, kind of exactly to have an accurate approximation or a, a useful approximation of this probability. All right, so this is the connection between uh, these things. And I assume, uh, I know that many of you know this. And just in terms of sketches again, so so, um, so these, what, what this is saying is, if this is the set of all the parameters of all the earth, uh, the, the ocean floor changes that lead to tsunami of a certain height, let's say the height is Z, that could be like two meters on average on shore, right? Let's say these are all the parameters, right? Then this these, um, these minimizer we're looking, we're computing here, actually, um, under reasonably condi uh, conditions, you can actually show that it has to lie on the boundary of this set, and this gun is this green point. So it has to lie on the boundary, and this is the point that is the most likely with respect to the underlying rate function. And these are the level sets of the rate function. So that would be this set. Okay, and you can do this for different um, event extremeness measures. That right, each one you get a different set, uh, and you get a different kind of instanton niche point here, and that's the information uh, you need and um, from an optimization perspective, I kind of I like these optimization problems because uh, they are actually for complex systems they're actually also like hard to solve. So that's another reason why I'm kind of interested in this. Uh, okay, can you set everything here? Again, so interrupt me please if you have any questions. Um, let me say a few words about when when can you make this connection between optimization and uh, uh, rare event probability estimation? Um, it's not too but it's not it's not going to work for every f. There's no doubt, right? So you can uh, there are certain limitations uh, for f. It's going to work for f's that are um, somewhat nice. Okay. Um, for instance, I need that f needs to be differentiable. This is just these are basically a summary of the assumptions that you can prove this connection. And uh, yeah, so we we have. For condition, this is also basically uh, to, to, to be as graph. Uh, Toby actually had these results with Eric uh, uh, already in some version, slightly different version, uh, a couple of years ago. So it's basically just you want that f is differentiable. Uh, for one of the methods that I'm going to show you, I actually want two derivatives of f. Okay, so that means f should be somewhat nice. Okay, um, the probability the measure uh, has to be somewhat nice for a Gaussian. It's not a problem, um, but and for for many others, one's net. But it still needs some niceness probability of the probability of the measure, namely that its cumulant generating function needs to exist and needs to be differentiable. Then I need, and that's that's a restriction that often you can check it uh, a, posteri a posteriori, but I need that these minimizers, um, these these green points on this previous slide, that these things are. Um, Unique uh, for 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 sets, and I understand that that's a that's a somewhat a restriction, but I need them to be unique because because they need to be unique to because I will basically the argument is based on the fact that these points capture the most important information about the, the density. Okay, so they need to be unique, and but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be convex like this. So they could also look like this, right? That's not a problem. This 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 could like like this, right? Um, yeah, so so this would still be the unique minimizer because it's it's gonna be the with respect to the blue uh, um, level sets. Okay, so so it can be it doesn't have to be contained in any half space or something, but the minimizer needs needs to be unique. 
And uh, in some sense, you need some regularity of the extreme event level set that's, um, it, that's related to the uniqueness. Okay, so after these assumptions, you can make this connection uh, that, that's telling you that uh, you compute the instant endpoints and then you can uh, use them for in this, um, in this estimate for the, um, for the probability. Okay. Um, and, okay. And uh, under all the reasonable uh, um, conditions, you can actually re reform. This is a problem where uh, that's a constrained optimization problem. So I'm going to talk a little bit about optimization here, where this condition actually means that f of the, you're looking for f of b such that f of b is equal to z. That means you're on the boundary of this of this set. Okay. And under um, reasonable assumptions, you can uh, you can actually write this constraint optimization problem. This constraint is a scalar constraint, so it's not too bad. You can write it in this form as a, you can basically as a formulation where you just penalize this, this, uh, this function f of, f of uh, b. And um, so then there's some equivalency between solving this problem versus this problem. Both, are, both can be solved. Some is convenient, more convenient to solve, to solve this, this, this one down here. Um, but um, either way, I, I, I like it like this because um, some of the work I've done uh, comes, from this, comes from this direction called PD constraint optimization. And our, these problems in PD constraint optimization, they always look like this. That means, what does PD constraint optimization mean? It means you minimize something, okay? That's, uh, that has two terms. So this only depends on the parameters, okay? B or theta. And this other term here depends on some physics. So, so in order to compute this F, right? You need to take this parameter. With this parameter B, you solve a PDE. That's the PDE constraint. In my case, it's the shallow water equation. Um, that gives you an H and a V, the, the, the water height and its velocity. And then you can evaluate this F actually. So right, it's an optimization problem where you have a constraint, an equality constraint, right? Given by a partial differential equation. That's what's called PD constraint optimization. This basically is a, a class of uh, high dimensional PDE, so infinite dimension, uh, opti high dimension optimization problems or infinite dimension optimization problems where you have to, where you can do some nice theory often about them and they're really challenging to solve because you have this PDE that shows up as a constraint. So uh, that's making this connection to this, this, um, this kind of problem class. Um, okay, so we have to solve many of these problems. And at the end of my talk, I would like to talk like five minutes about numerical analysis challenges that, that come from solving these problems where you have the shallow water equation as a constraint. All right? But let's assume we can do that now. And uh, how, how can we use this then to kind of compute this basically the, the prefactor um, uh, in this in this in this uh, extreme event probabilities? So um, there's there's so several ways. So first, I'm going to basically show you the thing uh, that you all know is that um, when you just do standard Monte Carlo, when you don't do any uh, biasing, any important sampling, then basically what happens is you get to a certain to a certain threshold z, right? And then it becomes more more unlikely to get sampled in this set that whose 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 measure you want to estimate. So your basic Monte Carlo estimator is good in in not so rare cases. So I should show you. This is the this measures the rareness, how, how large that is, and this measures the corresponding probability. Okay. So if you're not very rare, obviously Monte Carlo, standard Monte Carlo and naive Monte Carlo is, it works very well, but it, it, but it's not going to tell you anything about when you get into quite rare events, uh, unless you you take a, a completely unreasonable number of, of of samples. Okay. So this is obviously not enough. Um, if you assume that this prefactor is just a constant and you find an easy way to estimate this, then you can, uh, you can um, use this uh, to, to, to kind of fill in this, this missing data. Um, but here you, you, have, you have assumed that this prefactor is constant. We know that it's actually not constant. So this, you can do this. It gives you some idea about the, the asymptotic behavior of these probabilities, uh, but there is an error in there. Okay, so that's why uh, all of us want something better to estimate these prefactors. So this is the, the, the thing we want to improve over. And so the first uh, thing that's also fairly simple is a simple important sampling idea where um, what you can do is you can uh, 
um, take samples from the underlying underlying probability, uh, yeah, from the underlying kind of rate for probability that leads to the rate function, and you kind of can shift them to the send to this uh, minimizer to the instant turn, if you want it like this, uh, just with this shift here, and then basically you have you, you you get the green samples, and you can usually use those green samples to as as important. Uh, sampling sample. So as you can see, um, uh, for none of the blue sample samples is actually uh, would be in the extreme event set, right? But after this shift, right? And after first you have to compute this minimizer here. After this shift, then you have actually many of them in this set, and you can compensate for that. And this gives you a very basic important sampler. So this allows you to say to actually compute, uh, estimate these 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 the probability of this of this set reasonably well. Um, this requires that the underlying distribution is actually Gaussian. I think that's not clear how to do this in a in, in non-Gaussian case. And yeah, and it kind of, um, when you look at the, the root mean squared errors, so um, you look at the standard Monte Carlo errors. So this, is a, this gives you some idea about how, how well you estimate the probability. And what you see in this expression is first, this is one over square root of n, n is the number of samples. This is the standard Monte Carlo estimator uh, convergence you will get. Then uh, there's this factor, which tells you that if you do standard Monte Carlo, um, if z goes up, this thing basically goes to, this blows up. Uh, so your, your standard Monte Carlo estimate becomes basically useless uh, for, for z, unless you have really large n, right? So this, this grows and this decays. So that's the, the usual problem, but extreme events, obviously. And if you do this important sampling, this basically shift, which is very simple and for Gaussians, what you can do is you basically get rid of this uh, factor here and you end up with an error. So the, the root mean squared error is the, the variance, square root of the variance divided by the expectation. You basically get rid of this factor and you just get this Monte Carlo factor. And then this factor, which very mildly depends on Z. So it's not completely independent on Z, but um, this actually is, is very harmless in terms of growth uh, for Z to, in, to infinity. So you get a much better estimator, but it's, that's a Monte Carlo estimator, but yeah, you will get, and actually this is shown here. So, um, so the green line is this Monte Carlo estimator. This is a zoom in, let's look at the zoom in, right? And uh, the dotted lines around it is something like a 95% confidence interval. So you can see that actually with this, with this first solving a bunch of these optimization problems. So here we've solved um, several, we have for, for, for several uh, Z, Z values here, we've solved these instant ton optimization problems. And then we've shifted the underlying distribution to this point and then used an important sampler based on that point. And that gives you a, a reasonable uh, approximation, as you can see here, right? And confidence intervals that are actually, you, that are pretty pretty okay. And uh, he, here we only used 100 samples for each optimizer. So if you take more important sampling, you will you will decrease these these intervals, right? You get better estimation. Okay, but that's this idea. And but um, the, the 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 idea I mainly want to talk about is this idea that um, so I've tried to argue through a my talk that this these points, this instant on point, if you want to call it like this, is very important for for estimating this this uh, this um, probability. But um, I want to argue that if you have one more thing, if you have um, if you take into account the the, the geometry at, at this minimization point, the geometry will tell you basic Lagrange multiplier theory tells you that uh, the 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 tangent here to the blue blue line is has to be orthogonal to that to the black arrow here and um, it, the, the 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 improved estimate I want to show you is that uh, if you just know a little bit more namely local curvature information around that point then you can you can uh, improve you can improve the computation of this of this prefactor and in a way that that it's actually it becomes exact when you go more rare when you go when you for set to infinity so the, the, the idea is you, uh, you approximate the set boundary here at that point with an expansion and that's the right line. So that's, you can think of it as a second order expansion of that boundary. Uh, so basically it has to do, it, it's, a, it's a Hessian, that you, it's a Hessian of F, you need a, a, 
Uh, I think we saw these terms also in the Laplace expansions that um, Timo showed earlier today. It's the Hessian, the second derivative of this map F okay, with respect to the parameters. Uh, that, that, gives you, that gives you local coverage information of that set. And if you have that, then you can actually um, compute your, uh, you, can, you can compute your prefactor um, pretty accurately. Um, so, okay, let's, let me, let, let's forget about the, the, the details here. It's based on a, basically it's based on a Taylor expansion of this F at that, at that one point. Okay, so in, in this, this Hessian matrix shows up, right? Um, this is of the size of the dimension of your parameters. So this might be an, an, a fairly large thing. And remember, F is something that's nasty. It involves the solution of a PDE, right? So this is something you might not have complete, you, you might not be able to just write it down or compute it explicitly. But uh, the way we, we can, but it turns out you don't need this thing explicitly. You only need it in certain directions. You, know, you only need to apply this matrix um, to vectors in certain directions. And only the directions matter that where the boundary of F is, is, has significant curvature, where it's not flat. When it's flat, it doesn't matter. So only the direction matter where this, where you have significant curvature and where, which are important for the underlying probability. So, so the directions where this curvature is, is large, right? If it's or non-zero non basically, and in directions in high dimensions that are somewhat important for this, for the underlying rate function. And so, so you never need to compute this thing uh, exactly. Uh, you basically just need to apply this thing in a few directions. Um, you apply this thing times the underlying uh, covariance of the underlying distribution in, in some sense and explore the, the important directions. And with these important directions, you get a, uh, an update term that, that tells you, that allows you to compute the, the, the prefactor. Uh, pretty accurately, okay. And this is quite this is similar to what what's called as what known as SORM in the engineering community. Um, the difference is that we have dif we 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 uh, slightly different ways to write it and how to compute these these important directions. Could you could okay. you comment on what the KIs are? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, these are um, these are the curvatures of the. Uh, I think these are the curvatures in notation. Actually, I prefer a different notation, but these are the curvatures uh, of the of the of the boundary in certain directions. Principal curvatures. I think that's how the engineers would write it. But I like. I, I prefer actually a description where you where you compute the where you compute the dominating eigenvalues of this matrix times the covariance of the underlying uh, probability density. And then you can see that only the, the ones that are dominating, the ones that are the largest ones, the largest, often it's very few, uh, matter to compute this, this prefactor. And you can rewrite it uh, in terms of principal curvatures, but actually uh, this is, this is where, where engineers uh, motivate this SOAR method. But um, I think it's, it's nicer to understand when you just think in terms of eigen uh, values of this matrix times the covariance matrix, because then you really see that only very few directions matter, matter namely the ones where you have strong curvature and where the underlying probability has a lot of mass density. Okay, okay. Perfect, yeah. Uh, okay, and then uh, when you do this, right, so you get like this, this, um, this red approximation. Uh, so this would be the one if you get with this second order or this kind of, this, this, this kind of ideas. And um, it's hard to see anything from this because you're always dominated by this exponential decay term, right? So uh, that's why um, this only compares the, the prefactor, right? The prefactor is the thing we want to estimate. And um, it turns out, so, so, uh, so the prefactor, we would, this is the prefactor we, we get from Monte Carlo where we, we, we should get a pretty good approximation because we actually get the, the right, the true prefactor. That's the blue line, but obviously, we don't get very far because this is an extreme event. If we do this important sampling, you get for the prefactor estimate, you get these green lines. And you can see it's noisy, right? Because we it, the noise would be reduced if we use more important sampling. But we know that this green, if we if we could sample it and we would get the exact prefactor, right? Because this importance idea uh, actually samples the real density. But um, you take you have to take quite a few important samples around every of these optimization points, right? To um, to get this 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 noise under control, or this kind of this this I mean, it's just a Monte Carlo error. 
Um, and the, the second order approximation to this idea, right, gives you this red estimation for the prefactor. And you can see actually they, they, they coincide quite well in this, in this regime. And you can actually prove that this, this second order approximation is as, at least asymptotically exact. So if you go, uh, if you make this is that, you make it more extreme if you go in this direction, right? And you theoretically, you can prove that this prefactor asymptotically will become exact or better and better as Z goes to infinity. Uh, so that that's at least so yeah, pre asymptotic. Uh, it's it seems to do very well, but the proof is only for for uh, asymptotically. Okay, and then just to, to to as a comparison, right? If you if you don't uh, approximate the the curvature at the point, if you don't have that information, and you just use a plane, so you just use what's called the first order method, then you would get this estimation for the prefactors, and you can see that that's that's um, uh, that's better than using it uh, than using it as a constant. But you can see that it's asymptotically not exact. Okay, so you get some estimate, but asymptotically it's not going to go to the true one, because this would be this first order method where you don't actually ignore the curvature and just use the half plane. Uh, okay, so okay, these are okay. I'm almost out of time. So this is just saying, so far these were all kind of simple, sim relatively simple um, setups. Uh, then there is this uh, attempt where we actually try to do physics relevant uh, um, simulations for this specific Tohoku earthquake. So this is a slightly more advanced, sophisticated setup for the specific earthquake in Japan. Uh, we don't, before we work with Gaussians, actually here we work now with a Gaussian mixture. So, so uh, to, 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 to come up with a better to, uh, with the Gaussian mixture and then we take the exponential of that. So it's like a, a, a mixture of log normals, okay? Because this is what you need. Let me see if I have that. Yeah. So if you want to actually have a, a realistic distribution that gives you earthquakes of a certain size, so this is the size here, okay? Earthquake magnitude seven, magnitude nine, with a certain probability, um, which we know from, from, from observation data, right? If you want this in your underlying distribution for theta, you, you won't get that with the Gaussian. So you need to basically take a mixture of Gaussian and then do use E to that mixture of Gaussian. Then you get you get the, the the correct rate, which which is basically that which is the the, theory, the rate the data is the blue line, and you can see over magnitude seven to nine we get the right probabilities of earthquakes of certain size. And then we use that for for our theta. Use again the shallow water equation, and then do this uh, um, extreme event. Um, this estimation of 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 how likely um, tsunamis of a certain magnitude are with this model, and then it becomes uh, becomes real, um, physically uh, more meaningful. Also because we use the log mixture gives you a sign for this for these distributions, uh, and that also makes it more, uh, that's also what you need. There's some physics in there that, that, uh, that you need to take into account. But I, I, I won't really have time to talk about this. And then you can do certain things. You can ask certain physics question, meaning for instance, uh, if you have a, um, if you have a, a tsunami of a certain size on shore, um, does it come from an from an event of, of an earthquake event of magnitude? With what probability does it come from an earthquake event with magnitude, with magnitude seven or eight or nine stuff like that? So you can actually ask some physics questions there that I think are quite interesting. Okay, so that's it. Let me just spend like three more minutes, if I may, um, just to, to show you a little bit what the the numerical, scientific, uh, the numerical math challenges are in solving these optimization problems, numerical math slash scientific computing challenges uh, in solving these optimization problems. Um, so we're talking about these problems. So minimize um, great function. In this case, it's just a quadratic minus something that involves the solution of the shallow water equations. Okay, So that's a minimization problem um, where in the constraint of the shallow water equation. Um, you want to optimize something like this, right? So the, the only way to optimize, uh, we know for optimization, we need gradients, right? So we need a gradient of this uh, objective with respect to B, the, the parameters, right? Uh, when we do compute gradients, we have to differentiate through the shallow water equation. And the east, the, there's, it's, not a straight, it's not so straightforward to do this, right? Um, so that's why we use these. Uh, we use an, what's called an adjoint method. If you come from the machine learning community, that's called back propagation. And for certain systems uh, in, in TensorFlow, you can do this kind of automatically. But if you work with PDEs, you have to um, just be a little bit careful. 
So how do you comp compute gradients for this? Um, the way you compute gradient for a certain B is you solve the shallow water equation, okay? Then you have to solve what's called adjoint shallow water equation. So that's something you derive. This might, might not have direct physical meaning, but it's just a, an efficient way to compute uh, a gradient. Uh, and it's a gradient with respect, um, it's, it, the, the parameter is high dimensional, right? So you wanna have an efficient way to compute the gradient because if you, if you think of finite differencing it, then you need as many solutions as you have, uh, as many solutions as you have uh, parameters. But, we don't want to do this. So that's how we solve an adjoint um, shallow water equation. It looks similar, but it's not the same equation. Also, this has to be solved backwards in time while this is forward in time. And then after you've done this, so these are two PDE solves, uh, you can combine them and to compute the gradient. So that's this, this expression. So this gives you a way to compute the gradient of these somewhat complicated uh, optimization problems by solving two PDEs. Okay? And that's, uh, the alternative would be to kind of do finite differences, right? But then you have to solve uh, as many PDEs as you have parameters, plus one, because, because of many finite differences. But it gives you an efficient way to compute comp gradients. And a similar trick allows you to compute uh, second derivatives in directions. And if you remember this, this one method I tried to show you is, um, that's what we need actually. We need to be able to compute second derivatives and apply it to certain directions to compute this important curvature directions. So that can be done with a similar way. Uh, and this is just showing that solving these optimization problems, um, you can do this in a number of iterations that does only weakly depend on um, how extreme the event is. So this is lambda, but this basically means Z goes to infinity here. So Z, the event becomes larger and larger, and it turns out the number of iterations to solve this problem with certain given accuracy does not blow up. It re re remains kind of uh, uh, somewhat nice. So this doesn't become much worse. Uh, Hessian applies, this is what I've already tried to say before, you need these second derivatives. And, um, and it turns out for, for this specific problem, you actually only need to apply these, these Hessians in these eigenvalues here, if you, if you look at this here, and only the dominant eigenvalues matter. So basically, after five of these eigenvalues, the dominant eigenvalues that you, you which you can compute with, um, with something called randomized SVD. So there are ways to compute this efficiently. And you only need to, for this problem, the, the most, the, the largest five or six to compute a very um, accurate prefactor. Um, so you don't need all the eigenvalues of this Hessian, you just need the important ones. Okay, so that's basically what's, what's being done here. And for that, you need the second derivatives, which you can compute with uh, similar methods as, as before. And there's a few other, actually several other numerical analysis challenges because the shallow water equations are hyperbolic and they can develop shocks. And in the context of shocks, you have to be careful um, with, with the existence of derivatives even. So that's why we, we use artificial viscosity in these equations to kind of slightly smooth out these shocks. And then we, you can show that you get the right derivatives. You have to discretize these PDEs. So, so I ignored it, but there's some, some interesting um, scientific computing numeric analysis work there. And um, I've mentioned that there is issues where, so this has to do with optimal control theory, right? And when you, if you remember at some early, they had this maximum over time and that leads to uh, time optimal control problems. The results are uh, use the smooth version of this object of this um, uh, event criterion, but there is a whole lot of interesting uh, co optimal control PD counter randomization problems that uh, originate from this perspective. Uh, that's basically what I'm trying to say here. All right, so these are the main takeaways. I showed you this uh, right at the beginning. So let me just uh, mention uh, two, two or three again. So the, the goal was to make things, to show, to have things that are somewhat insensitive to extremeness. Uh, that work in high dimension parameter spaces, which, which you get from using these uh, adjoint methods and realizing that um, you only need this second derivative Hessian in a few directions, okay? Um, it's an expensive to map that involves the shallow weather equation, uh, has to do with the large deviation theory, makes tries to make this connection. And yeah, and, and um, obviously it would be nice to actually do these things in 2D because tsunamis in 1D are not super, less interesting in 2D, you can actually have way more interesting phenomenon interaction with boundaries, islands, all kind of stuff. And uh, 
mentioning this this method where you use the curvature of that set right this is a method that does not use sampling so that gives you a pretty good asymptotically exact estimate of the probability without sampling so if you're interested in in not only computing these probabilities but also like let's say trying to um, uh, have an outer problem around them uh, meaning trying to kind of influence these probabilities um, then this might be a, uh, a good approach to actually do optimization, right? For instance, um, where you try to control or, or change these probabilities. That's hard to do when you do samples because you would need something like derivative of that, of that quantity that you estimate with respect to a, a, an external parameters. But if you do this, this um, approximation with this local approximation around the instanton, you might actually be able to, 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 um, to, to write down problems where you want to optimize or control a quantity that, that depends on the rare uh, event probability because it's because it's sampling free in that sense okay uh that's it and here's yeah here's just some of the papers uh, that were used and the, the main summaries and that's trying to make this connection between these uh, optimization problems and uh, estimating extreme event probabilities and with applied to this um, uh, somewhat comp more complex problem of saying something about tsunami probabilities Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Georg. Uh, let's give a round of virtual applause to Georg. Thank you so much. And I want to open up the floor for questions. There's one question actually in the chat asking about how the model matches with the tsunami in Japan. Um, you sort of alluded to that in the 1D, 2D, but maybe you can say a couple of words more. So um, it's it's a little bit bad because admittedly a one-dimensional tsunami is a, is a quite strong simplification. So I um, I don't I don't really know. But the goal is with this with this uh, with these things actually with this uh, second part which I mentioned here that oh, sorry so these things right so that we actually try to have a setup now where we uh, where we really try make an effort to model the underlying probability probability correctly right. And then hopefully we can say something about these probabilities. Uh, for for the single tsunami event, uh, I think that just means if you know the the, the slip and the, the bathymetry change, which I think they know now for the 2011 tsunami, right? So then it's just a question about forward computing a tsunami and then seeing if the, the observations correspond with the probability map. People have done this, I think, in a bit. And so I think they people have done that. Um, the, the goal here, yeah, so... Mm -hmm. So this is a prob this is trying to say something about probabilities, right? For an in, in individual event, that's you cannot be say much. That's really then just how, how, about how accurate your forward model is. So that's a, a semi answer, I guess. Great. Rainer, yeah. I th I think you're muted. Thanks for this nice talk. I have two questions. The first one is. Um, where you presented this kind of um, um, instant tune based importance sampling uh, and the estimates that you get rid of the exponential part, but still have this, um, let's say, conventional part in front. I'm a little bit astonished because um, I would guess that um, if you enlarge your Z further and further, then the instant tune is more or less exact. So you would need one sample to capture it. Is what I'm doing wrong, <laughs> and uh, that is a little bit what we see in our numerics also in Georges and I. We look I, at I'm I'm not sure what mean with instant is exact, right? This root mean squared error, right? Is is the is the ratio of the variance with it divided by the expectation, right? So yeah. if you make z larger and larger, this expectation here, this thing goes to zero, right? This 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 yeah. this term. So it's really the ratio about the, the variance versus the, the expectation. So um, um, so you're saying in the in the limit the instant becomes exact, but yeah. but but the instanton doesn't give you anything. It doesn't give you information about the prefactor, right? And you have no access. To you what do you do about the prefactor? It it becomes exact if you if you in the log in the log 
probabilities, but not in the in the actual probabilities. I think that's maybe the difference. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. So the incident, the, the large, the theory tells you uh, this that this ratio this ratio goes to one, right? But that doesn't tell you; it gives you no information about the prefactor. I think maybe that's the that's the difference. Okay, let me just stay there. But I think that's the difference. I think because in when you say incident, I think you you you're right, right? If you take uh, logarithms, then the ratio goes to one, but that means yeah, okay, uh, it, okay. it's exact. I, but I think you are right. You are right. The other thing is you are. Um, it, really, your result um, by looking only at this combination of um, you know, curvature and the probability. I think that is um, hopefully also the key for our problem, uh, Timo. Um, and um, that also must be reflected, I know, um, of this low rank um, approximations of the Riccati equation, Fenner, and so on. And that must show up that it automatically finds the right uh, low rank approximation. Or is there a more direct way to do this? I mean, we could probably follow exactly your way um, to do this, which is one opportunity. But the other way would be um, to do, let's say, a Tucker approximation of, of um, or a Schlucker approximation of the Riccati equation, and it automatically follows the right uh, direction. And that's so, just a good question. So that is, uh, yeah. I would like to hear your, your impression. So I, I'm aware of this connection. I've talked a few times with uh, Toby, Toby Grafke as well, uh, or we chatted at least about it. But I, I, I agree. So basically, what you have to solve is you have to solve and basically you have to solve a generalized uh, eigenvalue problem that has like this, the Hessian of f equal to the covariance matrix. I might get it wrong here. Of so but eigenvalue problem like this, um, something like this, right? Where so basically in this both shows up the second derivative of f and the the underlying underlying um, underlying um, covariance and I think if if it's not Gaussian then this would be replaced by the second derivative of the rate function so basically it doesn't have to be Gaussian and then you mm -hmm. have to solve a problem like this and you can solve this in eigen, and you only need the dominating uh, uh, eigen the dominating directions of that eigenvalue problem and. Um, and you can do this without actually ever building these matrices. You can use these randomized SVD things to just get estimate very accurately the, the, the that's what these randomized SVD methods do, the, the, the dominating directions and corresponding eigenvalues and dominating in the sense that they're important for the second derivative of F and the second derivative of the rate function. And mm -hmm. that gives you this, 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 yeah, this, this uh, often this reduction that you you don't waste your time in figuring stuff out coverage of f in directions where that are completely useless for the underlying probability and yeah. vice versa. No, that that that's um, what I mean. Some time ago, we um, uh, Timo showed explained a little bit this conditional filtering, and if you do the same thing uh, for the filtrations, you get very simple objects. And that must also be reflected or in this low dimensional structure. Okay, thanks a lot. I think um, that is one direction we definitely have to follow. Yeah. So how big is now, uh, how many eigenvalues did you take? Something like five or? Yeah, yeah. So basically, I mean, it, obviously it's gonna depend on the physics of the problem, right? So yeah. it's, it really depends on the, on the physics, but the good thing is, and that's what I like about it is, it's, it's depending on the physics of the problem and not on your discretization or on anything else, right? And, and so it's it's the it's the right thing I think to, um, to to look at, right? Here you see basically you compute these eigenvalues, right? And then you see how much they affect the prefactor, right? And basically you have like a decay here from order one oh, to yeah. order ten to the minus five, and then you see like these things that don't matter anymore, right? You can add them, but this is just mm -hmm. this correction is so. Doesn't so that's basically how, you, but, uh, how quickly this decays depends on the physics, right? So it, yeah. So how flat it is, yeah. Okay. How big yeah. is your theta space? I don't, I don't know whether you mentioned that. Yeah, the theta space is actually here not as high. The theta space is only twenty for this case because I, I, I showed you these functions, but underlying is something lower dimensional. Yeah. So that yeah, my theta space for this for this example is, is twenty, but for other tests we did is even if we increase that size of the theta space. It doesn't increase much the, 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 how the spectrum looks, the angular mm -hmm. looks. So uh, it's not going to make too much of a difference. So but, you think it's then, realistic to use randomized SVD for like 10 to the 10 instead of 
20. Um, yeah, so you mean 10 to the 10 parameters? Yeah. Uh, I think so, right? I mean, I think you can just okay, do yeah. it, right? And yeah. you will see, right, how, how well you capture. Random SVD has comes with very good estimates these days, so you can really, you can really, you can really quite efficiently compute. Um, you know, if you can afford two hundred of these applications of these second derivative operators to vectors, right? You will get a pretty good estimate of the first hundred fifty eigenvalues, mm -hmm. and then you can see how it decays, right? And you can you can estimate. I mean, there's an you can estimate the error you're gonna make and. Um, and, and each evaluation is a for PDE, yeah. Each you know each evaluation is an application of this of the second derivative uh, of, of yeah, f, sorry. right? But so it's a PDE yeah. still. It's two PDEs actually, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. each one evaluation and is joint. Two. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's one 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 linearized forward and one linearized adjoint, so it's two yeah. PDEs, right? But then, but I mean, yeah. And there's also still some little bit of artificial viscosity in there, or do you? or no in the PDE that you're solving? Is there so, some regularizing yes. new, but that graph for the eigenvalues hopefully will not depend on. I, I think that. we even tried that. It doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, the field is called, it's just, yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you want to avoid shocks, right? Otherwise you have to do shock capturing or something like that. Exactly. So, I mean, exactly. It's, and it goes to zero as you refine the mesh. I mean, yeah. But you have the dissipation only on the forward equation or? No, it's it's also it shows also the, the adjoint equation is also is 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 just derived from the forward equation. So if you put something in the okay, forward, so you also get this, it will show up in some version in the, in the adjoint. And, and and it has a different sign there. By the way, that relates a little bit yeah. to, to uh, it has a different sign there, but it it works out because you have to solve it backwards in time. So that looks very similar yeah. to what to, to the Burgers uh, team yeah, mentioned yeah. actually. Yeah. So yeah, somehow I think that's the same problem adjoint problem as yeah, yeah but. Yeah, but in this case, it's not a problem because you have the right coefficient because you saw it the right um, sign for solving it forward in time to, and for the agent solve backwards in time and you have the right sign. So there's no growth. It's the, it's, it's the, doing the right thing in this context. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, yeah. th thank you so much again. Um, I think let's open up the floor to to any questions, any ideas, any brainstorming. It was a long day and certainly a lot of ideas, but we, there's still some time uh, to chat. If uh, I think certainly one of the directions how to reduce the dimensionality of the Riccati equation. So maybe there are some ideas in this direction.